yeah i have started the live streaming uh, so within one minute we can start the session abhignav be ready yeah okay Yes, Abhigna, you can start now. Uh, we are having participants on the YouTube, so they will be stream, uh, viewing from there. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. audible. Yeah, yeah, you, you're audible, and you, now you can start. Oh, thank you. Good morning, everyone, distinguished participants, ladies, and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you to the webinar on Grounded Breeding at Ecrosat, 45 years of journey, touching 38 countries. In this virtual conference room, I see such amazing guests and dignitaries from around the world sharing same interests and enlightening one another with the advancements in the field of agriculture. I'm sure we are also reaching out to many new practitioners, technologists, innovators, business professionals, and civil society representatives, fellow mates, and many more people. A warm welcome to you all. We all understand the importance of science, technology, and innovation in our day-to-day -day lives and the ways in which they're transforming the world. If this was not clear earlier, it is blindingly obvious now alongside the intricacies arising with the art at hand. Science, technology, and innovation are indispensable for a response to and upliftment from current and forthcoming scenarios. Equally important are deployment of scientific inventions, innovations, and technological solutions on a scale that will reach the target audience. Why here? Why today? What is the purpose? We are all embraced by the presence of the distinguished and well-rounded dignitaries to shed some light upon the varied measures to be taken under consideration on breeding aspects in agriculture. All our online webinars aim to discuss leading edge technologies and recent scientific developments in addition to the immediate challenges in agriculture and elite sectors. The idea is to familiarize students and professionals about current research trends, relevant and pioneering technologies in plant genomics for high-level analysis and interdisciplinary areas that are embraced in leading laboratories by excelling scientists. Plant Genomia is a non-profit organization promoting and publicizing plant sciences and investigations in the field of agriculture across the globe. We organize various webinars and developments comprehending research in plants for all the students, researchers, industrialists, and professors internationally. Here at Plant Genomia, we hold a global team of reputed scientists and research scholars from various parts of the world, distinct states of India, the United States of America, United Kingdom, Nigeria, Spain, etc. Technical support is laid to us by scholars from the Department of Genetics and Plant Data. Our motto is to disseminate every bit of knowledge among all. We believe that no research is accomplished until broadcasted, and that it is an ongoing process through layers and lapses of time. I would also like to extend my heartiest welcome to our esteemed speaker, Dr. V. Chanila, today's panelist, Dr. Mukti Sadhan Basu. The core subject specialist team, the core support team, our esteemed founder, Mr. Alamuru Krishna Chaitanya, and the lovely audience. Before we begin, let me clarify the process of attaining the certificate. The certificate application form will be shared anytime during the webinar. Filling that form is very mandatory to have the certificate. Please do not ask for certificates frequently while the session is in progress, as other delegates may feel disturbed. We shall be providing for sure, don't worry, and kindly note that the web previous webinar certificates were delayed due to the holidays of Festival Dashara and will be updated and issued tomorrow evening in our website. 
Now we have the very much admired founder of Plant Genomia, Mr. Alamuru Krishna Chaitanya, to address the audience and guests present with us today, and to remark the initiative taken up by Plant Genomia and his team. Over to you, Chaitanya. Thanks, Abhigna. I hope I am audible and clear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Fine. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone who are watching us here in this virtual gathering all over the world. Welcome you all once again on behalf of Complete Plant Genomia and team. I'm delighted to say you that Plant Genomia received a good number of registrations from almost various countries across the globe. We had achieved a good record of statistics in our webinars. Almost 35,000 plus people watched our webinars from 98 plus countries, and it was so amazing to share with you. With an aim to promote plant science research, Plant Genomia is organizing the talks from internationally renowned scientists who are well known for their research skills. We are in the process to launch our scientific forum for getting the guidance from scientists to the selected participants in writing scientific manuscripts, papers, books, chapters, proposals, and many more in the various disciplines of agriculture. Plant Genomia is all about knowledge dissemination and would be a package of library of several such initiatives in the near future. We thank you all for the kind support and participation. I must truly thank all the scientists and the speakers for the guidance and encouragement to do many such activities. Today, we had a well-renowned speaker who is a talented scientist and an efficient researcher going to deliver a talk on groundnut breeding at Ikriset, 40 years of journey touching 38 countries. Today's panelist, Dr. Mukti Sadan Basu sir, is a senior most dignitary who had 36 years of service in the ICR at various capacities. Also, we had a few important persons in the meet today, Dr. Sunil Chaudhary, associate scientist at Worldwide South Asia and many other researchers. Groundnut is an important food and oil crop in semi-arid tropics, contributing to the household food consumption and cash income. Although there are several production constraints due to various challenges in many areas, today's research by excelling scientists to elevate the profitability and production in terms of the quality and quantity is noteworthy. ICRISET is one of the pioneering institutes having such research. I'm glad that today's speaker, Dr. Janila Mam and panelist Dr. Mukti Sadan Basu sir are here with us for sharing their experiences, challenges, and many more. The title chosen by today's speaker is very interesting. That is Groundnut Breeding at Ikriset, 45 years of journey touching 38 countries. In this beautiful virtual gathering, I'm delighted to inform you that we had registrations from 70 plus countries, and this will be a great learning session for all of us to hear from such eminent knowledgeable personalities. I heartfully once again thank Dr. P. Janila Ma'am, Principal Scientist, Groundnut Breeding Ikriset, and our valued panelist, Dr. Mukti Sadan Basu sir, for accepting a kind invitation in very less time out of your busy schedules. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shadamuru. Those were some very gripping words coming from you. While we are presenting a gesture of gratitude, I would also like to thank Dr. K.P. Vishwanathan, former Vice Chancellor of Mahatme Phule Krishi Vidyapit, Rauri, and Dr. K.V. Peter, former Vice Chancellor of Kerala Agriculture University, for giving their valuable forward message on Plant Genomia webinar. Before we begin, I would like to call upon Dr. Sujeshri from IARA to introduce our panelists. Dr. Mukti Sadan Basu, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhikna. Dr. Mukti Sadan Basu, sir, uh, is an eminent scientist, internationally recognized expert on peanut research and agriculture evangelist. Dr. Basu is currently the managing director, SBS of Consultancy, a highly professional data-driven group of experts from diverse scientific and technological fields, including food, agriculture, and life sciences based in India, European Union, and US. Previously, Dr. Basu served the ICR for 36 years in various capacities, importantly as All India Coordinator, Project Coordinator and Director in National Research Center for Groundnet. During his tenure as Coordinator and Director, Dr. Basu successfully led several international projects like uh, United Nations in Development Project, UNDP Project on Food and Nutrition Security through production of aflatoxin risk-free groundnet. Australian Center for International Agriculture Research on Screening of Water Use Efficiency in Food Legumes. Again, ACR project on breeding for drought resistance in groundnut, international funding for agriculture development, IFAD on farmers' participatory research in food legumes, and European Union funded project on Bambara groundnut for food production in semi arid um, Africa and India. Dr. Basu has also served ICRISAT Asia Center as visiting scientist in model seed systems and UN IDO international consultant in Africa on aflatoxin management. In addition, Dr. Basu had led the positions like Executive Director in Urvara Biotech New Delhi, responsible for managing the entire business, Vice President in PR and D, uh, Christian Seeds Limited Maharashtra, Hindustan Insecticides Limited, a government of India enterprise New Delhi as a consultant and a founder member, 
and also Nas uh, national agriculture innovation project of icrs independent consultant business planning and development uh, dr ms basu uh, did his msc in agriculture and phd in genetics and plant breeding from university of calcutta and joined icr in 1972 sir uh, with all our due respect we would like to thank you for your presence today and we felt great pleasure to have you among us on this occasion now i invite you cordially to speak few words on today's topic and also go ahead with introducing our speaker dr janila ma'am thank you sir thanks sujaya for uh, introducing me an old guard but uh, love to live with the young generation to learn more and uh, i am very pleased that at least got an opportunity thanks to alamaru for giving me to appear in this platform and uh, speak few words more particularly listening janila uh, not very old friend but my uh, she uh, researcher work together maybe for one decade she is there in ikrisat i will introduce her uh, of course uh, uh, just speaking few words about what is happening how uh, i am associated and deeply involved uh, with the krisat and the national agricultural research system as you said covered everything almost only as a special remembrance uh, in one word i can say in your 45 years of journey i took part at least for 30 uh, 30 years yeah 15 years less so in your 45 years journey i i worked with you for uh, 30 years and that through icr and ecrisat system and more broadly to the nars system taking state agricultural universities together my major first appearance in ecrisat was in 1982 when i joined groundnut breeding program and uh, i can still um, remember the luminaries during those days i mean there are uh, several of course in groundnut program uh, i must take name of dr nigam lg reddy who was also with me in iit kharagpur for some time then uh, basudev rao uh, particularly uh, i remember because janila is working on uh, early nation basudev rao's first project was breeding for early nation groundnut then pala subramaniam that is in uh, i mean your foliar fungal diseases dr mehan divya reddy the virologist ranga rao our entomologist uh, arshian rao and there are so many i mean right from johansen uh, white man dr nene dr mcdonald that was the days in 1982 my first appearance and working together and uh, i continued till 2007 uh, from icr side collaborating with ikrisat after that i spent about 2 uh, years in ikrisat as visiting scientist in developing uh, seed system particularly for high volume crops like your groundnut chickpea and pigeon pea supported by government of india project and in between we had several projects uh, with ifad unido eu and all related to groundnut i mean promoting food legumes uh, i mean making india's uh, nutritional security uh, i mean traveling towards nutritional security do ground nut is an oil crop but it's a potential food legume as you know and particularly i mean throughout the globe and time has come to address malnutrition ground nut uh, should be uh, appearing more as a food crop than oil crop of course breeding strategies are different and janila is uh, addressing and aware about it and uh, only janila i will take 2 minutes because after all it's a 45 years we worked in this line peanut breeding and what i feel at this old age just to share with you the young stars who can carry forward if you feel that yes it has a merit i mean as you know during 1980s as i said i joined 82 so during 80s our major focus was early nation bringing a crop groundnut crop in 90 to 100 days and i still remember use of chico in um, breeding program to cut down the duration of course yield is the primary factor then earliness and we we traveled a lot at least bringing varieties fixing it by 100 days 105 days and i remember vasudev rao that days time no he was the breeder specifically assigned for earliness breeding program in groundnut of course he left and then joined private companies and in that process simultaneously we had disease resistance program also particularly screening in hotspot where dvr help 
the pathology group health, Subramanian health, and particularly the hotspots like location, I mean, in uh, Aliyar Nagar, Bhavani Shagar, in those areas, we had two or three hotspot location for RAST and uh, early uh, leaf spot and left leaf spot. We used to screen a lot of germplasm, taking them, making selections, and then incorporating in the breeding. So that was major focus during ITs and use of, of course, microbial strains for increasing yield, rhizobium and all those things were developed for specific situation. Now, as we landed in 1990s, uh, that time the, the, we felt that fresh seed dormancy incorporation is becoming important in Spanish because, um, you know, um, in situ germination. So a lot of emphasis was put at all India level for fresh seed dormancy, including Bhava Atomic Research Center. They also started doing it. Then, uh, of course, yield and yield attributing traits, we have been all the time working on that uh, to have a stable yield with quality traits accepted by the traders because ultimately it's an industrial crop. It has to fit in their machineries, uh, right from size to oil content and all those things. So breeders continuously worked on that. And that time a new era start that is making peanut virus free, particularly, uh, I mean, uh, not virus free, that is resistant or if not resistant, at least tolerant to major viruses. And uh, you know that peanut clump, peanut um, stripe, then peanut bud necrosis, those were the, in those days, it was the major viruses. And most confronting was the peanut stripe virus, which um, I mean, it's a sleep of quarantine, entered from Thailand and Southeast Asian countries to our germplasm in NBPG at Delhi. And from there it passed to even uh, I mean, southern states, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka. And we had, uh, I mean, long time to contain it, if not eradicated. We, we, we feel that we have eradicated, but that's a major task. We traveled across the country to contain the virus. And I am sure the peanut stripe virus is not causing any concern. And it's a multidisciplinary approach, right, from pathologist, virologist, entomologist, breeder, and whatnot, because there are lot of uh, insects know those who are carrying those viruses. So probably one of the best example of what ICRISAT ICR could create and that how to contain it. And whereas it is still thriving in some of the Southeast Asian countries. Of course, during that time, we started realizing groundnut alone as a sole crop may not um, uh, be giving a reasonable yield per unit area. So we went on for intercropping. Why I say intercropping? Because again, it's your canopy um, work on canopies, maybe your chickpea canopy, sorry, I mean, it, it is intercropped with PGNP, canopy of PGNP, canopy of groundnut, it's sardiness, and particularly it's combination, row ratio, those kind of research went on to bring a very dynamic intercrop system in groundnut to make it still, I mean, yield stable, particularly in sat region, where groundnut is an important crop, followed by your PGNP and, uh, I mean, other food legumes. But in 2000, our uh, approach, research approach uh, went on uh, farther height. What I should say, it's a height. We started working on water use efficiency involving Australian Center for International Agricultural Research and uh, roping Australian National University, even CSIRO, and working particularly for the carbon isotope discrimination as a tool for measuring water use efficiency in groundnut screening germplasm, thousands of germplasm, the target environments. Why I say target environments? I say country having 8 million hectare in India at that time, we had our specific drought areas, early season drought, late season drought, mid season drought. So we classified those drought areas, creating facilities for screening, scientific screening, and subjecting thousands of germplasm over three years, identify the particularly water is efficient lines. Uh, I mean, on, basis, on the basis of few parameters, particularly specific leaf area, leaf water potential, then carbon isotope discrimination, partitioning, uh, I mean, those factors. And then using them in the breeding program to develop drought resistant variety by the time climate change was in place. And at least we could make use of that information in developing climate resilient varieties, both for Africa, I mean, uh, Australia and India. That was a major journey, again, multi-country, multi-scientists, uh, I mean, project worked for seven years and probably that is one of the, I mean, still living memory with me. And I was lucky to 
uh, I mean, steer the project as uh, Indian program leader for that uh, from ICR side. And uh, that time, of course, um, uh, there was another change. So long we were confronting for increasing oil yield in groundnut because basically it's an oil crop, but slowly it was realized groundnut is equally important as food crop. And then we started breeding for confection inequalities. Janila also has put uh, her hand in that. And then we have a lot of confectionary varieties. And I should say Ecrisite and BRC is the father of those uh, varieties. I mean, bold seeded, low oil, high protein varieties, which are having very high uh, confectionary values. Now hats off to Janela and uh, uh, I mean, Bera, who developed that high olic variety together and contribution of Ecrisite continuously, particularly in developing varieties of excellence are always there. And we have been doing it meticulously. I still remember one thing, which uh, I mean, during the uh, tenure of Dr. Nigam, we could do it jointly, finding a variety which can survive at 5.2 uh, pH level, well, highly acidic soil in Northeastern states without putting any soil amelioration, giving two tons seal per hectare. I mean, what I wanted to mean, we have high acid soil tolerant varieties also in the cells of Ecrisat. And uh, I mean, that was the first variety, maybe within India, and I am not sure about in uh, Southeast Asian countries where acidity, soil acidity confronts, but we have those kind of novel varieties. So we work for riverbed situation, we work for spring situation, residual moisture, we work for rice fallow situation, and then again, uh, I mean, your high acid soil tolerance situation. But with that things, we are still not comfortable, I should say, in groundnut because of the drastic climate change and requirements are going to be different. Probably time has come, we should cut down, uh, I mean, hunt for oil, increase in groundnut, maybe a part of one fourth can go to the oil, uh, I mean, groundnut as a oil crop. So some breeding program must be their crop implement program, but major program should be focused on the food uses. And when you talk about food uses, aflatoxin resistance, tolerance, whatever you say should be there. And those uh, varieties should be very much dynamic. And uh, time has come when you cannot grow probably groundnut as a sole crop in most of the areas. And you need to have your intercrop. When you talk for intercrop sustainability in groundnut, particularly rain fed legumes, then probably we should have another round to go for crop modeling. Earlier, we had crop modeling taking University of Florida. Ken Booty was with us, and uh, particularly in Australia also, there were a lot of research on, uh, I mean, uh, crop modeling. But now this crop modeling will be something different. Maybe, uh, I mean, studies on allelopathy, when you take groundnut as an intercrop with your cassava, or maybe, uh, I mean, uh, other crops, particularly uh, tapioca, groundnut, and uh, uh, these crops and so also your PGNP is already there. So kind of root system, allelopathic reaction, they are, um, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so compatibility, those things probably need to be started in this new area, particularly in the 21st centuries, when we are going to address certain new issues. And shade tolerance, of course, is going to be very important. And as you know, the rice fellow, it is there, and you know, at least, uh, uh, I mean, in India, out of 44 million or 45 million hectare rice, at least, you know, I mean, uh, about 23 or uh, 20 million hectares either remain fallow or some, um, some other short duration crops are broadcasted to have some kind of yield. Those areas could be targeted for groundnut for having very high yield. And we have seen that in rice fallow, our yield levels are very high maybe not less than three ton per hectare as we have been harvesting now. So these are the challenges. Our uh, group, particularly peanut improvement group, and since Janila is having the responsibility for the whole of Asia, the principal scientist in Ecrisat, those new requirements with the changing climate, changing um, environment, and changing need, uh, growing crop together. So togetherness is very important now. And of course, new pests and diseases, they will be there always. And that's a big challenge, how we can uh, make our crop productive, predictive, remunerative with the changing climate change and more bringing adversities in the system. That's the, that's the uh, turning point. We are now working on use of data sciences in predicting yield. 
and though basically I am plant breeder like Janila, but uh, still we are switching over, mending over, trying to learn something that how we can really take historic data for 50, 60 years and then uh, have a kind of uh, development. Uh, I mean, feeding a crop, particularly different moisture regime, climate change, and uh, leaving a sizable yield for the society to survive with the health and vigor. So with this, probably I will not take much time. Uh, I should welcome Janila. It's a, uh, you are my inspiration in these days because it is that you are the principal scientist looking after the SCR region, uh, I mean, requirements. And I know groundnut is the global crop and whole globe look at Ikrisat. Fortunately, I had the opportunity to serve at Ikrisat in uh, Africa centers. Malawi, I was there. My posting was, of course, from the unit of side, but we had two years continuous, um, I mean, interaction with the scientists there, pathologists, breeder, agronomist, and wonderful development, particularly they are very, uh, I mean, comfortable with the seed system. I have seen the variety Chalimba, how it really touched the ground each and every nook and corner. So I have some kind of uh, resentments here. I shared with DDG and even DG uh, after my coming out from ICRISAT that some model we can follow the way Malawi is providing seed to their farmers and farmers are not crying for seed as it is happening in India. I mean, you are sitting in Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, you have a project, but still those states are seed hungry. And another constraint um, you have to understand, we are releasing variety because maybe releasing variety, producing seed is may not be the, uh, I mean, your CGIR uh, mandate. But when you are developing a variety, giving birth to a child, you must see that your child, uh, even uh, they are growing, I'm mean, growing outside your territory, are healthy. But um, bear with me, the varieties we developed at Ikrisat, utilizing our uh, NARS, mostly the university system, I mean, uh, SAUs. Two examples, it is, it is not I am criticizing, two examples I am giving just to learn and think how we can have an alternative path, rescue path. Say, for example, Gujarat is the leading state for groundnut. That time it was 2 million hectares, 20 lakh hectares. Now it has come down maybe 15 or maybe close to lot to that. But if you see that most of the varieties are still, uh, I mean, gaining the round 90% varieties from the Gujarat Agricultural University. Because the son of the soil has some kind of, uh, uh, I mean, attachment. I, I don't blame, but those varieties are also uh, uh, very good so far adaptability is concerned. Similarly, in Andhra Pradesh, you see 90% of the seed in Dane, data seed in Dane comes from one or two varieties developed at Kadiri Center. So that, that is a good sign. Yes, these local varieties, universities, varieties are really gaining ground. But only thing, the novel varieties, what Ikrisat developed, Say, for example, for the entire Northeast, the salt tolerant, acid soil tolerant variety, no one could develop it, we, we developed, but these are uh, now, uh, I mean, put in the shelves uh, of uh, gene bank. And, and farmers, I should say, deprived. So we have to have some kind of seed development system for that to keep our babies alive elsewhere and live there happily. So it is not that we cannot do, we can do it with little support, with little movement, and with uh, model system uh, projects, supporting to the now Central Agricultural University is there in Manipur. It is uh, during my time, we created a center there, the ICRP center in Manipur. Uh, same way for acid soil, for the rice fellow, we created a center during my time in, um, I mean, red lateritic soils of West Bengal. So there are very strategic location we are targeting and we have centers. Now it is um, your administration, scientists, and within the mandate of CGIR and ICR, ultimately we are, I mean, working for the same cause, promoting groundnut, whether in Africa, India, or anywhere in this uh, world. So let us see how we can develop a full-fledged seed system where farmers will not cry for seed, I mean, seed of good seed. It is not that uh, TMB2 seed of uh, 50 years ago, what we developed, and nothing is, when nothing is available, TMB2 seed in the name of TMB2, whatever seeds are available, farmers still buy and grow groundnut. And that's the reason we get less than one ton yield per hectare, which is not 
true for other countries, even my neighboring state uh, countries. Forget about US and other, I mean, Australia. So probably the first is seed system development, seed viability, seed storage, and particularly resistance to sore grain phase. Those are, of course, subsidiary things will come in the way when you move in that direction. And again, challenge is your, uh, I mean, uh, heat tolerance, cold tolerance. And even now we can think of breeding varieties for water stagnation situation, if not flood tolerant. They may come when things will submerge because of the glaciers are melting. So, and your ground, not particularly coastal saline areas, whether you talk about Odisha states, Fort of Puri and all those districts, you talk about Gujarat, particularly Koch, Bhuj and other things, maybe after 100 years, something will come under the water. And uh, I mean, we must, there will be frequent stagnation of water. So it's a maybe 50 years ahead, we, may, we must think and see that crop uh, gets the, uh, I mean, uh, equipped to face those challenges. And Janila, I know you personally, so my, I am introducing my Janila. It's a, earlier we were Panchapanda, if you, if you name right from Nigam, LJ Reddy, Dvedi, um, then uh, Basudev Rao, uh, and, uh, and who else? Uh, yeah, um, uh, so, and then after that, Oruna, of course, there. So, Ikrisat is always maintaining the gender basis. Now, Janila is there, Oruna left, and you are, at least my hope that you will be addressing the situation, the way it emerges and the challenge you know how to face it. It is, at, is having that kind of open mind and I am happy that I serve such kind of organization which are open mind and uh, I mean not gender biased and uh, putting all uh, strength together to move together with India, Africa and the rest of the globe. So your uh, this is my theme I shared that at least you can think certain uh, issues, what you can carry forward. And I know your uh, probably journey started with, again, earliness, but uh, incorporating resistance to foliar fungal diseases. Then you work for quality, particularly you are the pioneer, the scientist um, in bringing high olic variety in India. So hats off to you that we have got it. And at least I am multiplying those varieties to promote it further. And I'm told some more seeds are available. I will be certainly taking and see that it is promoted in Newcomb Corner, particularly the uh, people dealing with confectionery varieties, exporting, they, they will be certainly benefited out of that. And then at the same time, uh, we need to devise our agronomy for those new varieties that will of course come. We will be, them, uh, I mean, giving the responsibility to our agronomists, they will come forward, agronomists, pathologists, because it re uh, requires a holistic support. Breeder, Janila, Basu cannot do anything without uh, agronomic plant protection research and, I mean, working as a team. So we are all there. And at least at this age, I am still could be a very much supportive to take your varieties to any height. Even we took your varieties to lay. Of course, it was a BRC variety. Then our uh, purpose was to take your Millennium Bowl when Abdul Kalamji was the uh, advisor to uh, Ministry of Defense during the time of uh, Indira Gandhi ji. So we airlifted some seed, BRC varieties, confectionery, grew in lay with polythene mulch and we got about one and a half ton yields per hectare. And now we are trying to grow confectionery varieties organically. I am with the Ministry of Defense. We have already communicated number of letters to them uh, for supplying snack, I mean, peanut, organically grown with low oil, high protein. And now with Janila's uh, beauty, uh, that is with uh, high, very high olive in that variety to send it for the Joans working in the freezing temperature as a snack food. That was the dream, dream of Dr. Abdul uh, Kalamji. So we are still uh, carrying his wish forward. And I am sure uh, we will be able to reach defense ministry to supply those. And I am asking for a piece of land there. We have a defense research institute in Leh, their farm. We are going to lay some trial if permission is given. Now situation, of course, a bit uh, different, but uh, that is our planning. Uh, we are already on uh, to give our, uh, I mean, Joans the nutri food, organically grown, free from pesticide residues. And uh, with this, I am sure Janila will be working again for the high water use efficiency aspects, partitioning aspects, 
And based on that, she will be also touching the modeling of a crop, remodeling of a crop with the changing climate regime. And groundnut has to go together with PGNP, maybe in the sequential cropping with chickpea. Uh, after Kharib groundnut, chickpea may follow uh, because these are all sequential crops and there are other food legumes. So with this, of course, I will be again interacting. I invite Janila uh, for making her presentation, which will be so unique for listening everyone. Last I probably listened to you in uh, Junagadh with the interface meeting with the industries and APIDA. So it's uh, my uh, luck and opportunity. I am again here to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Krishna. Now you, uh, floor you can take. And Janila, Janila can be invited again from your side. Okay, Suja, please. One minute, sir. We are having small network error from. More than? Uh, we are having small network error. One minute will be doing. Okay, this. okay, oh. please, please, please. Meanwhile, if Janila can interact. Uh... Yeah. Well, let's wait, uh, Dr. Basu, because I need to, I think they need to fix that error because this is a live stream. Yeah, I think it was fixed. Thank you, sir, for uh, giving a brief introductory remark. And we are ha heartfully congratulating you for again uh, being the panelist today. And before introducing today's uh, speaker, I would like to uh, attain the, like, clarify the process of attaining the certificate. As mentioned, please, participants, do not disturb in the chat box as other delegates may be disturbing. And coming to today's speaker, Dr. Janila Ma'am is the principal groundnut breeder at Ikrisat based in Hyderabad and leader of the flagship program on variety and hybrid development at CGI Research Program on Grain, Legumes and Dryland Cereals. Dr. Janila has a PhD from the Indian Agriculture Research Institute, IRA New Delhi, and has 20 years of experience in the University of Hyderabad, Acharya and Ganga University, Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnosis with the International Crop Research Institute from, for, for the semi-arid tropics since 2011. She's the editorial board member of Theoretical and Applied Genetics International Advisory Board member and member of the International Peanut Genome Initiative. Her, her team led the release of first high aluric groundnut varieties using mark rusted selection in India and shared these lines with 10 countries. Her team also led the development of early maturity varieties with polio fungal disease resistance in India. Janila is passionate about deploying the process innovations in groundnut breeding and testing pipelines to enhance the rate of genetic gains and improve the operation and cost efficiencies. Significant outputs from the, uh, her endeavor include the reduced breeding cycle time, mark rusted selection, peanut quality using NIRS chip, uh, seed chip technique for SNP genotyping, and many more. She is pas passionate about furthering the crop network groups represented by multidisciplinary teams as a platform for crop breeding, uh, groundnut designs, and many more, testing the advancements and delivery in Asia and Africa. She has mentored 20 research scholars and postdoc and imparted training to 20 research centers from Asia and Africa and published over 70 research papers. Uh, and now we are happy to have Janila Ma'am here with us. And Ma'am, you can please share the screen and go ahead with the presentation. Uh, thank you, Krishna Chaitanya, for that introduction. 
and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening uh, to the listeners. And actually, I'm really delighted to be here uh, among you this today, this morning here from Hyderabad. And uh, man, I was uh, kind of amused to see this young uh, researchers, budding researchers, uh, putting this as a platform uh, to enable knowledge sharing. So let me first thank uh, Krishna Chaitanya, Abhigna, and Sujaya Shri, and all that team from Plant Genomia for having me over here and uh, putting up this platform uh, for knowledge sharing among the researchers. This is really fantastic. Let me put it this way. And I also thank Dr. Basu, so already setting stage for this conversation and sharing his own uh, journey uh, for which he was part of it, right? That was really fantastic. And the insights you have already shared, I think might have started people thinking about uh, various aspects of groundnut breeding. So let me first start the sh sh screening, uh, sharing the screen. So, uh, can somebody confirm that you can see this? Yeah, it's from here. Okay, thank you so much. So, when uh, Krishna Chaitanya reached out to me uh, for this um, webinar and also asking me for the topic, I mean, I chose this topic, which is about 40 years of journey. Definitely, I was not there in all this journey 45 years. But then uh, during the pandemic, since the pandemic started last year, I have been uh, reading a lot of uh, history books. I'm a science student, but then I was interested uh, recently more in the history. I was particularly reading all the three books of Yuval Noah Harari. And most recently, I'm reading uh, the historian uh, uh, Bergman, who has written this book, The Humankind, uh, The Hopeful History. It's a fantastic book. So when, from this, I was picking that history is really very powerful. Okay, not to uh, not only just to understand what the past is, but to understand our present much more better and plan for future. So I was thinking that the same could be true and very true indeed for the science aspect, right? Particularly for an uh, uh, for an uh, applied uh, research like agriculture, which is connected very much with the producers like farmers, industry, consumers, and all these. So, yeah, I mean, that's how, uh, I mean, I thought that, I mean, while I'm talking about the current work, what we are doing over here, I should really think about and have a look at what was this journey, right? How did it start at Ikrisat and how we came to the uh, present where we are now? And I should very explicitly mention that this journey was with national program partners, particularly. Dr. Basu has already mentioned his own journey uh, which he was associated with the Crusade for almost 30 years. My journey was much less than that, maybe a quarter of this uh, 45 years. But then I would uh, uh, like to share my understanding and what I have picked up from this journey. So in this uh, webinar in the next, uh, I think 30 or 40 minutes or so, I hope. So I would just uh, take you around uh, a brief history of the program and uh, how it has impacted various countries and also the current status of the work, what we are doing over here at ECRISAT in the last decade. So that would be the presentation basically. So I should, uh, before even starting the presentation, I would like to thank each one of uh, uh, the researchers from ICRISAT, national partners, advanced research institutes from US and Europe, the donors, the industry partners who are engaged in this journey for their contribution. So I, I may have made several omissions because I've just uh, picked up some parts of the story and try to present my own uh, uh, thinking over here. Um, okay, okay. So yes, so uh, the title says that uh, we have the uh, ICRASAT and, and together with the national partners touched 38 countries. And here are the countries which are highlighted on the global map in red color. And the numbers indicate the number of varieties which were released in these countries. These are the direct releases, but the contribution could have been much more than this in terms of where the program partners have used the lines uh, Dr. Basu, in his uh, introductory remarks, mentioned about several traits, right? Several traits, specific, interesting lines as parents in their uh, crop breeding program to develop many more varieties than what you see the numbers over here. So such is the impact. And uh, 
uh, I, I mean, there were no systematic studies made uh, 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 covering all these countries so far to look into the impact, but then the, the area coverage and the numbers itself uh, is a good measure of what uh, contribution it has uh, made. So, I mean, I would like to share this recent study which was published in PNAS uh, by the group from University of Georgia. Uh, they were looking at uh, the tracing at uh, the wild arachis uh, uh, genes moving from uh, uh, South America to all over the world. And this is the map which I picked up from that uh, paper, which shows from movement from South to North America and reaching out to Icrosat over here. And it is from here that these, uh, uh, particularly the foliar fungal disease resistance coming from Arachis cardinaisa, it's a wild deployed species moving across to Africa, all the countries, Asia, all the regions, as well as Australia. So, ICRASAT has played a pivotal role in using the uh, gene I mean, germplasm sitting in the gene banks for the benefit of the humankind. So, when I say ICRASAT, please always uh, read it as ICRASAT together with the national partners. Because all the work uh, which has been done over the years, just to say here 45 years for groundnut specifically, is an collaborative work which has been done. So, I think. Uh, it, it, so, I mean, I think it's very evident from this uh, map, the important role played by ICRASAT and uh, we should also be thankful uh, for the more liberal germplasm exchange days in 1980s and 90s than we have today. We have a lot more restrictions on germplasm exchanges and I hope, I think that should be uh, overcome by the governments and different policies. And uh, this is the, just the current uh, status of uh, various national partners in Asia and Africa. Uh, 47 countries in WCA region, Eastern and Southern region of Africa, uh, Asia, that, we, that currently ICROSAT is working. I mean, I'm talking about all the three programs. We have three regional programs, one sitting here at Asia, the other in ESA region, and then one in WSE region. So all together, reaching out to the partners in 47 countries, either directly working, uh, wherein we are organized the multi-environment testings. With some partners, it could be at the level of sharing of the advanced breeding populations and segregating generations. Now let's go back when they started all. So it's 1976, 45 years from now. Many of you on this meeting may not be born by then, right? So a group of uh, four consultants were uh, called here uh, to Hyderabad to discuss and suggest the possible groundnut uh, international research program. And this consultants have said that groundnut did, do require international research, right? And Iqlusat would be an appropriate uh, center uh, to carry forward this research. And when they stated why this research is needed, what was clearly elucidated was the formation of world germplasm base and also the sharing. I mean, I, I, mean, I would ask you all to recall the second slide, which I said that from Iqlusat, the Araf, uh, how the Arrakis cardinals alleles moved across Asia and Africa, contributing to foliar fungal disease resistance. I think the goal which was envisaged in 1976 was uh, achieved. Right, and uh, more so uh, an exchange of information training, which is uh, very important for, and it's core to the Icrosat's work. I mean, this was being identified as a, one of the key uh, area where why this international research at Icrosat has to be started. And see, groundnut is not just a food crop, it is known as an industrial crop. But then there was a clear awareness that despite being an industrial crop, it has a great contribution because it enables the farmers, to, the, particularly the smallholder farmers, to sell, and, sell the produce and have the incomes, and which will have a great impact on the food security of the smallholder farm families. And there it goes. A proposal has been put up and it has been approved by the governing board of ICRASAT to have a groundnut improvement program over here. And from here, so what? let's just have a look at the objectives of the breeding program. I mean, see, I mean, whenever we talk about a groundnut, any breeding program, as a matter of fact, we would the first question would be, what are the objectives, right? 
high yielding yes resistance was there yes and a very clear mention that ecrosat doesn't want to produce finished cultivars rather it would be engaging in supplying the breeding lines and working closely with the national program partners so that a further selection would happen at the at the uh, appropriate agroecology in a country and the release would be done so i think uh, this this principle is there even now and this is how we work with the national program partners and uh, i mean uh, more and more the breeding programs have been told particularly both in the particularly in the public sector to emulate uh, the ways and means of private sector breeding well that's correct particularly the market research would be very very useful and one such uh, aspect which has been asked to use is designing the product like what kind of a product we design right we have i mean i will touch upon this in my latest slides how we are doing it now but when i look at 1976 i think a pretty good job has been done even at that time look at this few examples so well at the time it was clearly mentioned that a, a, an enhanced engagement with the national partners is required to see what kind of variety has to be developed for a particular agroecology in a country and here are a few examples one from sudan and other from malawi and for sudan a clear indication for export is the requirement of large seed I mean, large seeded varieties often which are long season while for the rain fed is the short duration cultivars which were uh, targeted to development for malawi also the scenario is same for confectionery and export trade is a large seeded one and for oil yes the small seeded ones will have a higher oil content also and the short season cultivars for the dry and hotter areas in the southern parts of malawi so this part of production uh, aspects have been taken well on board for the uh, dev testing of the varieties for specific agroecologies and also the industry you know different industries requirements as well as uh, and uh, i mean let me mention I mean, that's when the program started in 1976 uh, at uh, patancheru hyderabad and small glimpse about how the program started in wca as well as esa in my next two slides so under international cooperation ecrosat was investigating to start program on groundnut and millet and that's how it started its uh, niger center to cater for both these crops uh, improvement program and it had started in 1988 the program in niamey niger and then moved to kano nigeria and since and then to bamako mali there were lot of uh, disturbances uh, in terms of uh, securities in these countries despite that the grounded program though had uh, intermittent uh, disturbances the program could be run continuously and now i have shown you the maps the countries uh, uh, through which the collaborations has been furthered or uh, renewed and uh, uh, very active collaboration is going on and good number, number of varieties have been released over there and similar is the story with the esa program uh, with the background of the droughts which has happened during the 1980s and the requirement to, to to meet the food security in the region the south african development community okay they have asked ecrosat to start a groundnut project and it started in 1992 with the support from canada and uh, the choice of the center to be start i mean the choice of the country to start this program on groundnut was malawi because since colonial period uh, malawi was the center for the legume breeding programs and it has been catering to the needs of all the south african countries so that's how the program started and 1987 onwards this became the groundnut ecrosat project wherein in uh, uh, the phase 2 and 3 they have concentrated a lot on technology development while in the later phase on started on uh, with the technology transfers as well and uh, the map over here okay let me if you can see here there are 11 countries over here in this region and almost 11 other in this region uh, where wherein the programs have been really uh, furthered on revived and uh, they they are now uh, having very vibrant programs uh, in most of these countries for grounded breeding program and i would like to share how this uh, i mean when this programs in uh, wc and esa started quite a bit of germplasm was moved from india the improved lines particularly and uh, 
when we were uh, moving uh, these lines, I mean, what helped us to see, right? What type of lines need to be moved in? I think this particular study looks at the homogeneous growing zones across Asia and Africa. And if you look at it, there are the agroecologists similar in uh, South Asia, which are there in our region as well. And that enabled us to see which type of variety and which duration would be the best suited over there in that region. And hence the exchange of germplasm, particularly the advanced breeding lines has happened. And uh, uh, before going into the technical aspects, I would say that knowledge sharing program has been the key to develop the uh, researchers in groundnut improvement programs across Asia and Africa. And more and more, uh, we have been trying to en encourage the participation of the women uh, in these research programs. As you all know that uh, uh, we need to work towards plugging the gap uh, in the gender. And I will just walk through a couple of uh, success stories, I mean, which were really, really exemplar kind of stories coming particularly from the Asia program. So this variety 9114 also called as Devi variety from uh, uh, in Orissa was a remarkable variety. It's a drought tolerant variety released for Anantapur district, which has almost like 0.7 million hectares in a single district and very uh, heavily prone to the late and mid-season drought. And an uh, on-farm study has been conducted in collaboration between ICRASAT and International Livestock Research, which has showed that uh, this uh, variety uh, adoption has increased the pod yield by 23% and reduced the yield variability, which is very important actually, uh, when we are talking about drought-prone ecologies by 30% and increase the milk yield. I think that's the most important thing when we are talking about the crop livestock systems. So this is a story which I picked up from early 2000s. And more recently, uh, when we looked at the adoption of Devi variety, which is nothing but ICGV 9114 in Odisha district, so 25%, almost close to 25% of the area in the state is covered by this variety. And this was possible through various informal seed systems, which Dr. Basu was mentioning in her earlier remark, in his earlier remarks, that it's time to that we need to see the dissemination of the varieties as well, which has enabled the adoption of this variety. As you see here from the seed source, there's a quite a substantial portion, 17% of the seed being accessed by the farmers through the projects run by the ICRISAT. Either it may not be directly from the ICRISAT, but the ICRISAT and the NGOs with which it is uh, working. And uh, uh, this is again one story. I think uh, these kind of stories are really very powerful uh, because they narrate the personal stories. Here we have the farmer, Miss Maria, who could uh, adopt the new variety and earn an income up to $117. This is way back in 2003 when this particular story was published. And what's more interesting is Maria could use this income to pay the school fee to her children. I think these personal stories are really very powerful. I think we need to talk about them and how a technology can make a difference in the life of a farmer is really very important as we go forward. Think about it. And in Vietnam, we have a very interesting story. So they have a main season, which is the spring season. But the biggest challenge similar to Odisha is getting seed for that season, right? Uh, here in Odisha too, we have rabi season and getting seed on time in, uh, for rabi cultivation in Odisha is a big challenge. And a similar challenge was there in uh, Vietnam as well. And introduction of an autumn winter season in Vietnam really helped uh, to solve this problem of uh, seed supply to the main season, that is spring season. So, and then if you look at the Vietnam's uh, seed, uh, I mean, yield increase over the years, it's a substantial yield gain over the years of over 1%. And this can be definitely contributed to the improved varieties together with the uh, practices like mulching and others, agronomic practices, that's what I meant to say. And uh, coming more closely to the recent stories in 2020 and 21, uh, I would uh, talk about the Hyolic story a little later with some technology de technical de details as well. But before that, I would like to mention the recent release of a confectionery variety in Karnataka. And uh, I mean, 
uh, what's interesting is the recovery of the percentage of kernels which are 70 percent i think this is what we are going forward and i will touch again about it in the, in the technical aspects as well how much of this large seed kernels will recover right that's more important here in this variety it is 62 percent which is really very good and that's about it. And there is a high oil variety which was released in Chhattisgarh re recently, uh, which has 52% as uh, kernel oil content. And uh, there are lines which are in the pipeline for release in Bangladesh. Like we have the early maturing varieties and drought tolerant varieties. A couple of them I have mentioned over here. And uh, in Myanmar, uh, one hyolic variety is here, which is really performing well. It is nothing but uh, Girnar 5, which was released in India, ICGV 15090. It's interesting to note this. And there are a couple of these uh, foliar fungal disease resistant varieties. I mean, these, these are the ones which combine early maturity as well. And they were showing higher yield in the MLTs conducted in uh, uh, Myanmar and are in the pipeline for release. So, I mean, uh, here is a, the pedigree of the Chhattisgarh Mungfali. Just wanted to draw your attention. This is also having tolerance for a late leaf spot. And if you look at the background of this pedigree, you have Arrakis cardinalsa. It's also an, in the parentage, it has its uh, this wild, uh, wild species as its ancestor. And this connects us to the first story and also gives us a clear indication that we need to really diversify the genetic base of foliar fungal disease resistance because across the globe right from americas africa and asia australia included as well all the foliar fungal disease resistance we are having in the cultivated types boils down to the one source that is arachis cardinase which is not a good news right it is jained and it is time that we think about diversifying and at icrisat we have started a program to diversify this as well uh, using the uh, uh, synthetics. And uh, well, if you remember, I mentioned that uh, the important thing is uh, the increase in milk yield as well uh, for the ICGV 9114 to sustain the crop livestock uh, uh, production systems. And we have the recent release to replace Devi variety in Odisha, which is ICGV Kalinga groundnut 101, And these are the parameters. And we are hoping that uh, uh, this would really replace uh, Devi variety and other varieties in the state to increase the uh, productivity and also sustain the crop livestock systems. So that's the kind of, uh, I wouldn't say introduction, background and historical perspective I want to bring in, right? And before going to the technical aspects, wherein I would be talking about uh, the breeding for foliar fungal disease resistance almost for the last 40, 45 years marker restricted selections, as well as the early generation multi-environment testing system, which has been put in place uh, to uh, increase the selection accuracy. And a couple of, I'll touch upon a couple of traits, selection tools and techniques as well. So to first to begin with the foliar fungal disease resistance, I think the screening protocols were developed very early on and were uh, extensively used to identify the resistant sources and use them in the breeding program and screen the breeding populations to select the resistance. And we have a field screening technique which uses an infector row uh, complemented by spraying of the spores and a detached leaf uh, technique method wherein the tetrafoliate leaf is screened in the dew chambers at uh, very high humidity conditions and spraying the spores. I think these two, I mean, in the detached leaf technique, the advantage is, uh, I mean, it is uh, uh, the component traits of the late leaf spot or the rust can also be scored. So, I mean, uh, let me just see how the different uh, foliar fungal disease resistance lines were developed at ICRISAT. So the first generation ones, um, uh, they came from interspecific derivatives uh, mostly, right? And then this is the pot shape and the seed shape that we had at that time, right? This is the first, one of the first lines which was, uh, I think, released in some of the countries as well. They are often very, very unattractive pod and kernel features. That's what we had as the first generations. And this going to the next generation when these are used as parents and we had a further uh, set of lines, um, they were like uh, fine, but uh, some reservations are there because they still had this beak. You look at this pod, you know, so still not very, very attractive. 
and duration would remain a challenge, continue to remain a challenge, even when we move to the third generation. Right. And when we have the current ones, uh, it started with the MABC program. We started in uh, just before I joined the Equitisat. So we're in three lines were uh, used for back crossing program to transfer the resistance for lately spot and rust. And the lines which had I wouldn't say very early, like 90 to 100 days, but then decent enough at 100 to 105 days. And they combine early maturity as well. So this is the progression which we could uh, make. And I think uh, this was, uh, I wouldn't say slow or fast, but then this was an incredible journey from where we had a huge burden of this uh, duration and an attractive pod and kernel features when we brought in the resistance to the ones which are the commercialized uh, varieties now and which are very much preferred, had all the preferred uh, market and productivity traits. And uh, yeah, this is an incredible journey. I mean, sometimes I think I wanted to do a deep dive into it, documenting it uh, even more in further details as well. And I will talk about little more about this MABC program when we had this fourth generation of lines. These three lines were selected for this MABC program that is JL24, TAC24, and uh, ICGV9114. JL24 is an Indian bread variety uh, which was introduced by ICROSAT to several other countries and went on to be released in more than half a dozen countries, right? And uh, when this this macro program was started, GPBT4 was used as the donor. Now, okay, let's look at the ancestry of GPBT4, which is a popular for foliar fungal disease donor used extensively across India. So if you look at it, it has a parent which has been uh, having uh, derived from an uh, uh, Arrakis cardinacea background as well. So uh, again, yeah, so the same conversation on having uh, uh, putting all our hopes on one source is not so good. And uh, it was the time, it was like, um, I should say, mid-2000s uh, and all, and uh, a little later than that, when, when the genomic resources are also being developed in uh, Groundnut, we had the first genetic map, followed by mapping of various QTLs and trying to identify markers. And at the time, it was SSR markers. And uh, there were like uh, four different markers, both dominant and co-dominant markers, which were identified for the QTL region, which was explaining 82% of phenotypic variations for rust. It's like a major gene for rust resistance. And the same region was also explaining almost like 65% of resist phenotypic variation for LLS resistance. So that was interesting. And then humble macro rusted breeding program has been started. Uh, at the time. And these are the set of markers which were used to select the major QTL, uh, one dominant and three co-dominant markers. And uh, uh, when we had the fixed lines with the QTL and we did extensive disease scoring, in the uh, disease screening, I'm sorry, uh, to see the, to select the best bet lines and also agronomic screening. See, if you look at it, uh, we had introgression lines, 57 lines in 9114 background, okay? And uh, lines with a score almost same to GPBD4 in that season, we had about 50% of the lines. So it is variable across different introgression lines. So which, so what we came to conclusion at this time is, so in addition to having a genotyping tool for initial selection, uh, uh, a next second level of selection using the phenotype would be really good. So an initial selection using the markers can knock away some of the lines without the QTL, and we end up all the lines with QTL. And as followed by a next selection for the phenotype would enable to fix the minor alleles, which together would give a desirable resistance. So particularly for late leaf spot. And uh, these were required to be assessed for the uh, agronomic traits as well, because foliar fungal disease resistance is, is not uh, alone going to uh, make a variety or a line to be released as a commercial cultivar. So that's when extensive uh, uh, agronomic trait evaluations were done. And uh, these are the lines. So six introgression lines of 9 had an uh, average yield of uh, uh, 2641 uh, cages. This is the range, right? And this is the yield, 2500 is the yield of 9144. I'm talking about that one particular trial which was conducted in 2013 and 2013 14 post training season. And this extensive agronomic evaluation enabled us 
to select the best bet lines which could be shared with the national partners to begin with india unfortunately we could not send this material outside india because gp body fever was a release cultivar which was used as a donor parent and i would always like to share this particular picture we have this tag 24 This is a tag 24 QTL introgression line coming QTL from GPBD4. And this is a picture we have taken at around I think 85 days of the crop, 85 to 90 days. So and you can see this disease and this one without the disease. It, it's really nice to see in the field as well this kind of differences. And definitely as a geneticist, I was really thrilled to see this in the field happening. You know, so it was really exciting. And foliar fungal disease resistance, I would say, is very important from the perspective of uh, uh, for uh, helm yield and also helm quality. And so we have assessed them. So this is the nine triple one four, and these two are the introgression slough nine triple one four with increased pod yield and helm yield. And similar is the case for TAC twenty four and GL twenty four. And here is the data which we got from uh, Darward as well, wherein the introgression lines showed a significant increase in pod yield. You know, resistance combined with agro economic performance uh, are the ones which we need to move forward so uh, i mean i think they are in different stages of release right now and then we were questioning so i mean see uh, if you look at our 40 years of journey with the foliar fungal disease resistance what did not happen is uh, breaking that linkage between the maturity duration and the resistance you know they both were together so then we were questioning if they were both linked or is it that possible But then, as we are really realized, seeing the results and how this screening for this disease was done, we thought that it's not because of the linkage, but because of the way we were screening for the disease. Look, so we were scoring the disease at 90 days, right? When an early maturing variety, which matures at 100 to 105 days, would be at the fag end of the physiological maturity stage, while a variety line which is maturing at 120 days is in the case. right so i think we are unfairly rejecting of the early or all, uh, all early maturing lines when we are screening for them for the disease resistance that's when we thought that when we are talking about early maturity the disease scoring has to be done definitely not at 90 days it should be much early than that maybe around 80 to 85 days that would give a much more appropriate uh, measure of resistance that's one thing the other thing we were like uh, thinking is when we are talking about this early maturity we should be really very Uh, conscious about when they go to the commercial cultivation the same could happen they could be really devastated by the disease because the disease pressure and the physiological maturity are often coinciding so i think these are the couple of things which we need to think about both from the breeding aspects and also for the commercialization of the early maturing varieties like 90 days and all and i'll talk about this market assisted selection program uh, here at ecrisat and before that just a background of it why we have to do this market assisted selection so let's all go back and think about this genetic gains equation in the numerator we have selection intensity right so when because it's in the numerator when we increase the selection intensity uh, then uh, the genetic gain is going to increase now how can we increase the selection intensity right by decreasing the proportion of plant selected if we have an uh, uh, i mean proportion of plant selected is the ratio of selected candidates divided by uh, selected candidates divided by selection candidates okay and this proportion can be reduced by increasing the denominator which is the selection candidates so i would just walk you through this particular table published uh, by cop in 2019 Uh, wherein, uh, for the same number of selected candidates, okay, wherein the population here we have kept it as ten, the proportion selected can be decreased by increasing the uh, selection candidates, and this automatically will increase the selection intensity and the realized genetic gains. But what is the prob uh, constraint for the breeding programs to increase the selection candidates is? if you have instead of 500 f2 population if you have 1000 your budgets needs to be double right so i think that's where uh, we need to think about different tools wherein we can cost effectively test a large number of selection candidates so that our proportion of plant selected decreases the selection intensity increases and hence the genetic gain is increased 
So with this, I mean, this is the basis I can say with the marker estate selection when we are thinking about it, how to use in the breeding. So this is the basic background of it. And with more and more cost effective markers coming into place, when I start, when we started the marker estate breeding program at Icrusat, I mentioned that it was started with uh, SSRs, but then we are moving to, a, we are now using a SNP based markers. Uh, which come at a cost of about uh, 160, that is $2 per uh, sample that includes DNA isolation. Let me tell you honestly, even that's not very cost effective, but still, uh, since we are selecting three traits using this 10 SNP panel, that is the major QTLs for rust, LLS, as well as the two mutant alleles for FAD A and FAD2 mutants, it still becomes a cost effective proposition. And I just wanted to run through this uh, breeding schema, the current schema which we use at uh, ICRISAT, uh, wherein uh, uh, after hybridization and testing by SNPs, the hybridity confirmation, from F2 to F3 and F3 to F4, single seed advancement is done and it is at F4 wherein the single plant selections were done. Uh, earlier on when we started the program, we used to do the selection in F2, but we all know as the genetics, uh, to the principles of genetics, we can harvest more number of desirable homozygotes as we move down the later generations as compared to F2. So hence we moved the selection uh, to F4 and from here we would do the single plant selections based on these uh, uh, SNP calls for the three target rates and then move on to the progenies, do further tests for using NIRS and also for fresh seed dormancy and further bulking will happen and then they go to the testing and what differently we are doing is, which I will also talk about in the next section is, early on we used to do all the testing here at Ecrisat at one site, considering it as a representative site. But now we moved on to the testing where even the first level of testing is done at multi-location sites. I will discuss about this when I'm talking the next section though in details. And just this is an example of the SNP calls, uh, which we do it. And uh, just imagine here in this slide, you can see 15 lines, right? 15 plants though, and this is a SNP call for two I have to make, right? And then when you have 10 SNP calls and you have thousands here, it would be a really challenge. Uh, I mean, one can do it in the Excel, but then generating the tags, going to the plants and all, there are there's an, uh, a lot of logistical steps which need to be dealt with. I'll come to that aspect as well. Just wanted to close this marker estate selection program and how we have this uh, uh, 15083 and 90, which were released in India, the first Hyolic uh, lines uh, to be released uh, in India. And uh, as I was talking about this logistics, see, when you have this uh, huge amount of data on thousands of plants, you need decision support tools, right? I, I mean, what I meant to say is to, uh, to deploy a marker estate program or even any other tool in, uh, in the ongoing breeding program, we need to do this uh, optimization of the logistics to uh, to deploy it in a large breeding program. Doing it for a one cross may look simple. Two, yes, it still looks simple. But then the moment you think about 50 crosses, you have to deploy the mark rested selection. We need to think about the uh, logistics, which includes the plant tagging, right? Then you have to do the sample collection. And then once you get the genotyping data, you have to go to that particular plant and harvest. So I mean, there are several like this. Uh, which one has to think about as a breeder when deploying the marker estate selection. So at least we, we made a small innovation using a, a seed chip instead of the plant to circumvent these uh, issues, you know. So we don't have to now require uh, to plant uh, this uh, F, F force in the field, the SSD, rather from the seed, we can do a small uh, uh, seed chip, which can be sent for SNP genotyping. And what we do is we store these uh, seeds in the same 96 well plate uh, plastic box in the fridge. And once the we, I mean, and we don't have to label it. We have to only uh, mention the box number. And we have, once we get the genotyping results, we can pick up only those seeds the, which are positively confirmed homozygotes and only those seeds can be planted. So, I mean, that's an, I should say that's one of the uh, problems following which was done uh, with a little innovation on using seed instead of uh, leaf tissue. Although a lot of optimization has to be done both by the service provided and by us in terms of sample size and in terms of the biochemistry at their end as well. And uh, I, I mentioned to you all that we moved on to an early generation multi-environment test testing 
uh, as against the single site testing which we have done for almost like 40 years so and again uh, as we are designing the product i gave two examples of malawi and sudan wherein we clearly mentioned even in 1976 which particular agroecology and which particular market requires which type of variety we were doing a little more deep dive into these things and this is a joint study from myanmar conducted by ecrosat and syngenta foundation for sustainable agriculture looking at the market segmentation and the opportunity in that uh, in myanmar and what comes out very explicitly is about 60% of it has a market segment of red type which is going to exports to china and uh, this is a good feedback uh, to the breeding programs and this to us particularly together with the national partners in myanmar uh, to uh, to uh, put in more efforts in sharing the lines with red seed so that they are tested and they are in the pipeline for release and this is one example of a target product profile i said that see now we are defining what kind of variety for a particular x agroecology in a country has to be released by describing all the attributes which we want to target see when we talk about a variety it does not have one attribute right it will have many but then what is that particular design it's like an iphone right so what are the what is the camera features what are the storage features and all those things so we are explicitly uh, talking about the attributes quantifying them if you see it here what is the score we want to achieve in terms of our disease resistance and all and working towards it together with the national partners so this is the direction we are moving towards and um, uh, i mentioned to you about the testing right and this testing also is done very systematically uh, much more systematically i would say uh, wherein it's starting off with uh, identifying the sites for testing by uh, classifying the gr growing regions here is an example from from india where in the growing regions were uh, divided based on the homogeneous production zones considering the climatic conditions the soil factors and not not much into management except for the irrigation and these are the seven zones in india which were identified and this is the area under each of these zones and based on these zones we have this target product profiles uh, and this species we call them we abbreviate them and uh, so those trials are been shared with the national partners in this region for example here we have virginia bunch and spanish bunch types which were shared this year these are the 2021 trials which we have shared in india i just gave one example in this homogeneous production zones so i, I mean i think such an uh, targeting would be much more uh, effective to have an uh, best suited line for a specific agro ecology that's the whole objective and as i mentioned uh, no initial screening has been done for the productive traits at the ecrosat they the, from, from the first year onwards they are going out uh, to the target population of environments where they are being tested and when we have this data uh, selection index scores are used to make the selection decisions you know when we make like when we test about 100 lines or 50 lines in a trial which are the one lines which we want to promote right we just go don't go by yield right there are several other yield parameters so how much weightage we want to give this is a conscious decision which we make with the national program partners so and then we gave this weightages for each of this uh, indices for example here is an example you can see for pod yield shelling uh, percentage and 100 seed weight and uh, based on this index the selection would be done and advancement would be made here in this case i think we would be selecting only 18 10 35 A similar exercise has been done. I mean, this we have started now uh, in the last since last year, and we have done for India and Myanmar uh, together with our national program partners. And this particular selection, advancement, and selecting very early on the right helps in many ways. One is this can go for the testing for the national program now in the national testing trials, and the second thing is they can be recycled into the breeding program so that we can uh, enhance the rate of genetic gain achieved. here i will share this example with the hyolic breeding pipeline so when we first started we have used sunolic 95r this is a released variety from usa which came to which was in ecrosat's gene bank with uh, both the fad mutant tails this was used as a donor to develop the hyolic lines so when we have this fixed lines at f6 and f5 generations what we did is we quickly used them as parents and started the crossing program so this this was uh, this was required because uh, the seed size which we are targeting 
was much higher because the hyolic was expected to be going for the confectionery, but the seed size which we got with sunolic was not very satisfactory. So that's when we have started this and we continue to do this even now. The lines which we get now are recycled as parents and this is the progression if you can see. When I say 15, these are the fixed lines in the year 2015. 16 is the fixed lines in the year 2016. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think I messed up something. Okay. Okay. And 17 are the lines which are fixed in 2017. So this is the kind of progression we could achieve by the way of recycling this uh, elite lines in the hyolic breeding pipeline. The other advantage we could also achieve is uh, cutting down the duration as well. You know, so uh, when we had Sanolik uh, as a donor, the lines derived from it were mostly like 120 days around that. So we were cutting down the duration as well. And uh, yeah, in the next couple of slides, I would walk through. Uh, I think I'm good with time. I think I should rush. I don't know. Somebody can guide me on this. It's fine, ma'am. No problem. You can. It's fine. Okay. So yeah, and uh, I would like to touch upon a couple of traits and the selection tools and techniques. So any breeding program would go like this, right? So you have a basic framework and as and when a new tools and technologies like I explained in the marker estate selection example are available, they would be deployed in the breeding program to enhance the genetic gain. And I would say that NIRS has been really very uh, of immense use to test the grain quality, particularly oil, fatty acid proportion and the protein content. And if you can see the prediction values of this uh, NIRS, they're pretty good. 0 0.8 and 0 0.9, which are very good and very reliable to make those initial selection rejections, right? I may not say selection selections basically, but you can reject a lot of material, which may not be very useful for the breeding program. And more recently, we could also do this uh, calibrations using the single seat with an R square value of 0.9%, which is which is again and again a uh, nice innovation uh, to be deployed for the breeding programs. So this, I mean, I should say that uh, NIRS has been a, a powerful tool for our hyolic breeding program at Equisat, and we are also supporting a quite a bit of national programs for their uh, students' work and for their breeding program as well. And I would just dwell upon this uh, high oil. Like this project started in 2011 with the support from government of India. I think uh, the work started much earlier than that, maybe in 2007 and 8, wherein uh, the plan was to release some high oil lines. Look, for a quality assessment uh, was not done in general for the kernel because often wet chemistry methods have to be done. They're destructive, expensive, and not easy to be done. And they required a certain level of homozygosity of the lines to be achieved, which hence they have to be done in later generations like F6, F7 and all that. So all these ones didn't uh, made it very attractive to have quality traits being used in the breeding pipeline for a selection method. So having said that, when we had when this thought process was going on to have this high oil lines in India, uh, because of uh, the ability that uh, groundnut can uh, bridge the gap for oil requirement in the country, uh, I mean edible oil requirement in the country from the domestic supply. So uh, what was done was uh, six, about 160 light lines from the breeding program were selected, right, and they were tested extensively for the stable oil yield performance. And from that, 47 lines were picked up and extensive multi-location testings were done. And from that, there were two releases from Gujarat, GJG32 and GJG33, which were released in 2017 and 18, uh, the high oil lines. And the most recently one was released in uh, Chhattisgarh uh, as uh, Chhattisgarh Moongfali one. They're all high oil lines and they were stable performing ones because they have been tested extensively at uh, various locations as well. So this is an interesting story I want to share. And uh, I mean, we didn't have to go back to the gene bank to get the high oil content because we had these lines. And then now by recombining them, we could have now lines much more, uh, better lines than this for oil content as well. And now we are thinking about combining oil with olic as well, because that's one another industry which has the potential in India, high oilic peanut oil. Already some companies are showing uh, immense interest on that. And this is a study which I want to draw your attention, which was recently published by our modeling team here at Ecrisat, uh, which has uh, predicted the climate change effects in the next uh, till 2050. 
can reduce the groundnut yield to minus 34% in some agroecologies to uh, increase of 43% uh, in some agroecologies because which, which means that there are losses which would happen in some regions and there would be gains in some other regions and there were some genetic options were also uh, suggested from that work uh, which talk about partitioning of the daily growth to pods and particularly and seed filling duration and the maximum leaf photosynthesis area right increasing that area as well so these are suggested as couple of the options if you want to increase in this uh, uh, areas uh, where we expect uh, the pod yield increase uh, this has this modeling has both uh, i mean this minus 34 to 43 range covers both pessimistic and optimistic estimates of this model with that background i'll just touch upon this uh, uh, work on uh, water deficit stress tolerance in groundnut uh, there was extensive programs which were conducted uh, by Australians uh, and uh, India joint collaborative programs, right? And uh, and we all know this drought tolerance is a complex trait. Having said all that, so what is deployable even today in the breeding program is the empirical approach, which measures the pod yield under stress and uh, the well-watered conditions. And the ones which are performing well in the well-watered and, and have the least yield penalty under water stress He's been used as a selection criteria to advance it, right? So, I mean, what does this mean? When I have to, when a breeder has to do a testing like this under well watered and water stress conditions, we need to wait till the homozygosity is received, reached, that is, which will happen only in the later generations, to set up these uh, replicated trials under different conditions, right? Which delays the selection for this trait. So there were several physiological traits like uh, identified there were surrogates and then selection for them could also improve the water use efficiency, right? But then their deployment within the breeding programs uh, remains, uh, I should say, limited or uh, very much limited because they are not very much amenable. And then at the end of the day, though they give uh, good adaptation, the pod yield may be compromised. So at the end of the day, the breeders have to again select for this uh, trait as well. So yes, I mean, one other trait which uh, we found to be useful is the seedling uh, vigor, early seedling vigor. So that, because particularly that gives an uh, adaptation to early uh, for, for proper establishment under uh, watered uh, uh, rainfed ecology. So that's been identified as a one key trait and we are seeing how this uh, uh, can be correlated with the early canopy vigor which we can measure using lysimeters so once probably we can uh, come up with much more confidence on use of lysimeter for measuring early canopy vigor we would be moving on using that because that will enable us to screen a large population and reject the ones which don't have that early canopy vigor so that we can get have the gains for water deficit stress tolerance uh, having said that, uh, this uh, wilting score has also been useful to some extent, and we do this in the breeding programs, the scoring. And uh, I would just mention this recent study wherein 100 lions were tested uh, by one student in a program and several uh, uh, superior performing lions based on empirical approach, though, uh, were identified for water dress and deficit stress tolerance. And high temperature tolerance, what was uh, affected in groundnut is the assimilation of photosynthesis uh, from the plant parts to the sink. That's that's the process which is affected because when temperatures are high and there is water, the grounded plant still grows luxuriantly, but uh, the pod yield is compromised. And uh, as much as 43% uh, of pod yield reduction has been uh, identified, and there were some lines which were identified to be insensitive, and they were uh, successful in assimilating uh, a good amount of photosynthesis to the sink and having retaining a stable pod yield even under heat stress conditions. I think this is one area of research which can be further pursued and we are pursuing uh, in this direction. And looking at this, uh, both stresses, the I mean, they occur in together as well. And the biological nitrogen fixation. Yes, I agree that uh, we do select when we are selecting for high yield and all we are automatically selecting for uh, biological nitrogen fixation as well. Having said that, we want to investigate more into how this biological nitrogen fixation is affected uh, under stress, both from the microbe as well as from the host plant itself. Uh, as a legume, this is a very important uh, biological process. And when we think about the climate change, this is a very critical process because, uh, I mean, this is where uh, 
the, as a legume, it does not require nitrogenous fertilizers, which cause uh, uh, climate change effects, as, which contribute a lot to the climate change effects as well. And uh, yes, for rainford ecologies in the Spanish types, fresh seed dormancy is a must. And I think we could, we could almost mainstream this particular trait in our breeding pipeline. And these are a set of lines which are being tested now uh, for uh, fresh seed dormancy in uh, Odisha. And I think uh, this would be a key focus for us because uh, in situ germination will predispose fungal additional fungal infections, including aspergillus, and is a huge quality problem and a health problem as well and can cause. And uh, as I said about the innovations, which we always try to innovate and use, the CT imaging is one tool, which is a non-restrictive method and helps us to assess uh, shelling percentage, kernel size. And we are also now making a calibration to determine the kernel size distribution, which is an important trait. So I think one CT imaging scan can give three traits, would, would make a real, real uh, useful tool in the breeding uh, pipeline. Uh, to make selection for these three important uh, traits. And why kernel size distribution is very important, here is a small example I would uh, draw your attention upon. This is from Girnar 4 and Girnar 5, the two Hyolic varieties which were released in India. And uh, 40 to 50 and 50 to 60 uh, counts per ounce are the preferred uh, uh, preferred uh, trade grades in Indian market. And uh, you can see that Girnar 4 has a much superior recovery. And I was told by the industry, this is the desirable recovery as compared to the Girnar 5. Of course, this is the seed which was uh, grown in uh, Ecrisat. I think if it's grown in Rajasthan, Gujarat, in better endowed areas, the seed size could be much larger than this. And uh, other innovation I want to share with you is with regards to advancing the cycles faster, which we call it as rapid generation advancement, right? So what we do is we have this simple chamber because in Hyderabad, uh, climatic conditions, groundnut can be grown round through the year. What we did is using this, we have constructed this base wherein we closely we can closely plant the uh, SSD progenies because at the end of the day, we have to harvest only one seed from each plant to advance it to the next generations, as long as we are doing SSD from F2 to F3 and F3 to F4. So I think this is one facility which we have built and we are using. I think this can accommodate only a few crosses. The plan is to further extend it. So the idea is to enhance the rate of genetic gain. If you remember the genetic gain equation, the denominator is the length of the generation. You reduce the denominator, you are going to increase the... Uh, genetic gain and when we have these fixed lines they could be recycled as parents and they can also go for testing and release as varieties as well and uh, i would uh, as I conclude this with this one slide so well these are the different rates of the first hyolic varieties which were released in india with the uh, national program partners uh, from icar and other countries so let me disconnect this okay and uh, I mean, when we were presenting this at the Science Forum, this was picked up as a case study at the Science Forum 2018 of the CGIAR for its critical partnerships. Please, I would like to emphasize this because when I was talking about this whole journey as well, I was telling that this is a journey of with the national program partners. And here too, it has been, uh, this study has been picked up for its partnerships with the national program right from the design, testing and delivery of the product with the industry, which is very relevant to this current day's uh, breeding programs, not only for groundnut, other crops as well, and the partnership with pu public and private seed sector, right? So that's what we want to work with as we want, as we want to uh, support the program in India with the seed systems as well, and of course, a donor engagement. So as I come to the end of my uh, presentation, I would like to uh, conclude with the success story and uh, again acknowledging the partnership with the national partners, uh, both in Asia and Africa. And uh, yes, I would be happy to take questions. Hello, sir. Uh, can, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, we request to please uh, go ahead for question answer round.
Janila, there is a first question. Is there any constraints in cultivation of varieties with regards to the nature of the soil? Yes. Constraints in cultivation of varieties? Yes. Regards to the nature of the soil. Yes, there are yes. many constraints, yes. right? So, uh, groundnut cannot be grown in uh, black soils, clay soils. At the end of the day, you cannot harvest. pH is a uh, constraint, right? because that would that, uh, alter the calcium availability. Calcium availability is very important for groundnut and more interestingly, the calcium absorbed by roots is not much used for uh, pot filling, rather the pots absorb the calcium. So pH has to be really appropriate for enabling calcium absorption. Water logging, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. Soils with salinity, so, I mean, all these problem soils are a big challenge for groundnut and definitely the loam soils, red loam soils and sandy loam soils are the best suited uh, for the cultivation of the groundnut. Yeah. And I mean, having said that, uh, there are varieties, even for salinity, which were found to be tolerant, right? And then for acidity as well, right? There are tolerant varieties. Drought, we all know there are many number of lines for that. Right, I mean, that's not though not a soil character. So what I meant to say is, I mean, there are improved possibility of improving genetics for adaptation to different soils. But then, having said that, some soils definitely no. Yeah, nicely explained. Now, Oniket uh, is asking, what are the challenges while developing these traits? The traits what you have referred, what are the challenges? So I think uh, it's a physiological traits uh, yes. contributing to yield. Right. So how how do you? So yes, up? I would I would start with the work which we started. Let me talk about the salinity. Right. Screening itself is a challenge. Right. So having a proper screen. So I can't if I even for the selection of a donor and the second stage is deploying it in the breeding, having a right selection protocol. Right. Enables the breeding programs. So having that in place becomes a key challenge for me as a breeder. I would look at it like that. Because if I have to screen for salinity, I have to go to that uh, soil saline sick plots or those uh, field spots. Or I have to standardize a protocol in the pot which would mimic the field uh, salinity, right? Uh, I mean, I, I just make a soil, soil solution and do it in a pot. That's not going to work, right? A saline soil in a pot should mimic the way it is in the field. Right? So I would say screening protocol, having a right screening protocol is the first challenge. If you have it, yes, we can do a big wonders. I, I should say that we are grappling with that even for drought even now other than the empirical approach. Yeah. Uh, the next question is uh, Hemang Baksi. Mm -hmm. She says that uh, is there any yield comparison of your high olic versus the prevailing varieties in that particular state? What are the yield of your hyolic varieties as compared to the prevailing varieties or ruling varieties in this state, particularly right. Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan? Right. So that's that's a good question. So I would answer it this way. So in the previous slide, which I have shown, there are the national. I can go back to that slide as well. Yes. So we have this two national varieties. These are the national checks: GPBD four and TG thirty seven A. Right. So these are the national checks, and this is the data which I picked up from the ACRIP testing, which had this uh, testing, uh, these trials. So before these lines entered into the national testings, we were tested in different states, which includes Rajasthan, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh. Right. And at all these states, they were tested comparing with the state checks in that particular uh, particular state. Right. And then only the ones which we are performing better than the state check went to the national check. I may not be able to give the right figures right, right away, but then definitely they are superior performing uh, than the state checks. Hence, they came into the national uh, variety testing. I hope that answers. Yeah, I think you have answered it. So. Next, coming to uh, uh, Bimal Kumar Chatri. He says that how long mass breeding scheme takes means uh, how long you will be uh, taking for uh, marker assisted selection for a particular trait. Well, uh, what I would say is if your question is the cycle time, uh, 
Hmm. With marker time. selection, without marker selection, the variety development times remain same. Okay, let it, let us be very clear on that. So, what would change your uh, cycle time is when you use a rapid generation advancement, wherein instead of doing two cycles in a year, see if I do only two seasons here in Hyderabad, that is uh, from June to November, and again November to um, April the next year. I have only two cycles, right? I can go from F2 to F3 and F3 to F4. That's it. Instead, if I do that same in that RGA facility, in the same amount of period, I can do three cycles, F2 to F3, 3 to F4, and then to F5. So that is going to reduce the breeding uh, cycle time to develop a variety. I hope I made it clear, right? <laughs> yeah. And the, the next question is, how long you will take that the resistant varieties uh, perform well, not breaks down. I mean, it's a bit uh, yes, I mean, difficult question to answer, but uh, yes. how long resistant varieties remain effective in the field? So, so yeah. let's see this. I just mentioned that we have the single source that is Aryakais cardinaisi for all the resistance we are using for rust, late leaf spot, early leaf spot, not only in India, entire Asia, Australia, Africa, South America, also North America. We are using the same, which is not good. That's what I'm saying. So we need to bring in others. So they have, we have Stenosperma, Digoy, all these species, which are also have also resistance for these diseases. At least Icrisat, we have started a breeding program. Now we have like F2 and F3 populations. So, I mean, going forward, the idea is to share these lines, having resistance for these diseases. Maybe same level of resistance, doesn't matter, but coming from a different source, right? So but that's Janila, what we are heading towards. Janila, I, I have uh, uh, some questions. I mm -hmm. need means clarification. Sure. Suppose uh, what I have seen uh, as back as 1980s, early 80s, when mm -hmm. early leaf spot was very predominant, maybe uh, disease of economic importance. Of course, rust was there and then followed by late leaf spot. Mm. But uh, with the travel, say 45 years, now my personal observation Early leaf spot has gone down like anything at many places, particularly yes. in the northern states, as compared to your southern. Yes. So that might be associated with the temperature, climate, and all kinds of things which are not conducive for early leaf spot sport to survive, and it's not really affecting it. So there are two reasons. Maybe the, uh, I mean, uh, the severity may increase with the increase of the load of the spores, particularly maybe late leaf spot of different strains and this coming there, uh, it may, and sometimes automatically it may disappear instead of breaking down, disappear. And uh, because of that, spores can't survive due to temperature, I mean, climatic changes and all these things, the factors which are not congenial. So probably it both way happens. Yeah, that's, that's a in, good observation. And so, in Ikrisat, what is the level of rust? Uh, I mean, uh, particularly during this period as compared to 30 years ago or so? It's, it's, it's very high. High. So this season we had a very high. So you, you, your observation is very, very, very good, uh, Dr. Basu. I really like that, and that's an optimistic view. You know. Mm -hmm. So yes, the disease may disappear. So I think uh, we have a climate change facility at Ikrasat as well, and then working with national program partners. So such kind of simulation, I mean, uh, studies are also being done, uh, predicting the increase or decrease of the diseases in the future climate change scenarios. We have this carbon chamber tunnels yeah. and all these things, where in such studies with, I mean, they have been doing with other diseases, not much with groundnut. I think we would be starting such studies in groundnut as well. Mm -hmm. I think that would be really very useful uh, information as we plan our disease resistant breeding strategies for the future, down the line 10 years. So when we are talking about breeding, it has to be very, very futuristic, right? Uh, so accordingly, we can also now probably shift our hotspots Yes. Uh, once identified for rust, identified for lately spot. So right. partly, particularly, I know Punjab and all those northern states were mm. the hotspot for early leaf spot. Uh, sure. Now no relevance. Yes. I think that, that's a uh, good valid point to revisit the hotspots as well. So sometimes think, escape mechanism and sometimes severity yes. mechanism both are working. You're right. Uh, now the question is uh, Suraj Kulkarni. Which physiological character is important for breeding groundnut for drought tolerance? Very, very complex. See, <laughs> not a single answer. Really complex uh, question, that one, you know. 
So which physiological character? So this is the same question I keep asking my physiologist to help me with, right? And I always say that if you come up with one trait, that's what I want to select for in the breeding program. And but then physiology is manifestation of several traits. That's what the answer comes in for me. And hence it was zero down on to the early canopy growth. I mean, this is very a bit early that I want to share, but then the factors which contribute that are to the early germination, early germination, early vigor of the seedling, and the early canopy growth. I think those are the ones which could be uh, a desirable one, the factors which contribute to that are the ones. So we did a lot of work on water use efficiency, transpiration efficiency, and all those things. So we have enough data and we have lines. And we went ahead to, even to think about the transpiration efficiency at a particular water uh, vapor pressure deficit. We're not talking about the transpiration efficiency at all the environments. No, 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 that's not the thing. We are specifically defining the vapor pressure deficit conditions as well and talking about them. While they're all good, when I'm talking about, they're all good to select the lines which are efficient, which are high water use efficient, and they're, which are very transpiration efficient. But when it comes to combining with the productive trait in the breeding pipeline, so we were definitely challenged with, you know, you have this carbon isotope discriminant function, right? Many are there, it's not one. But uh, for the breeding program, yeah, I still grapple with that problem. So I, I should say that uh, we don't have an answer for that right now. I have I have one idea because mm -hmm. uh, we handled that uh, water use efficiency project for seven years mm -hmm. and transpiration efficiency and partitioning. Yes. Uh, probably I found some role that is playing yes. in displaying the harvest index. Right. But but uh, in the indirect process, I might have uh, uh, I mean worked uh, while dealing with the transpiration efficiency on the functioning of stomata. Mm. But suppose in um, such a uh, circuitous route, if I don't go, simply I can see or examine the stomatal function, uh, particularly yeah. in, in, in harsh environment mm -hmm. with a high temperature, also of a very uh, low water availability, how stomata can switch off, switch on, if that mechanism, ultimately what is happening you now, because if stomata remains open in uh, that kind of, as you mentioned, that high temperature with the water limited condition and whatever, uh, plant gets the water if transpired. So there is no point. So mm. during the daytime, if there is switch up mechanism under that kind of situation, and again at nighttime when temperature, I mean, little bit of, uh, say, uh, uh, say, uniformity of uh, is there, I mean, in terms of temperature or the moisture availability. So it is not that harsh. And if the stomatal function takes place uh, in odd hours, uh, I mean, in congenial hours rather than odd hours during the you know, day temperature. So probably, probably some kind of drought tolerance mechanism plant um, uh, can always achieve. And indirectly, probably by the measuring transparency, though we didn't measure the stomatal uh, efficiency of a given plant, uh, that may be helpful. So if there is any direct measurement, what I wanted to mean, direct measurement of stomatal function to predict that which could be drought tolerant, Hmm. which is closed, remain closed, most of the uh, stomata remain closed during the daytime, opens during the evening or night time to yeah. minimize water loss and, right. uh, I mean, contribute towards the sink. Yeah. Hmm. I do not know. It's, a, it's a just a, maybe bullshit, maybe uh, yep, some kind. Yep. No, it's an idea. Yeah. I think there were some studies already done. But as I said, that there was uh, nothing very conclusively coming out that could be useful. What I, what I, what I say so... Uh, I started my career as back as 1970 with jute. It's a high-density crop, grown mostly as a rain-fed. That's fiber crop, bus fiber crop. You might have heard the name of jute. And there, the since uh, there are a lot of competition for light and uh, uh, particularly the uh, carbon dioxide bringing to the leaf, I mean air yeah. flow. So what uh, we wanted to measure, I measured by uh, particularly the stomatal uh, presence that is on the adaxial, abaxial side and they are openings with the sign, I mean sun movement, morning hours, mid sun and declining sun, how stomatal is performing. I mean opening and closing only, I mean during those 70s, uh, that much of thing. And that too, what I did, the lacquer, no, your nail polish, transparent nail polish, putting on the leaf, taking this uh, film, 
and then putting behind the microscope and under the microscope we could see how many stomata are abaxial and adaxial side of a genotype and how much are closed gut cells are closed and gut cells are open so that we understand that uh, how um, uh, i mean efficient a particular genotype in closing and uh, opening the stomata uh, with the change of uh, say uh, sunlight means morning noon and evening uh, how they can so that becomes the most uh, important plant for uh, i mean selection <laughs> maybe in in groundnut that kind of things may happen uh, if some studies can be done i mean blindly i'm telling uh, but uh, but there might be certain yeah uh, good thoughts yes uh, they can be thought about yes. yeah, yeah and uh, the next question is uh, just one minute Uh, Ramesh uh, Sabantula says that for SNP genotyping, can we use KSP genotyping? Uh, I mean, a platform for cost uh, uh, reduction. You are the master here. Say SNP well, versus KSP. Well, I think the cost which we get with uh, SNP is the most, uh, I think, what should I say? Most cost effective, well, let's, yeah. let me say, what is available right now. There could be something else coming up next year which could become a more cost effective. I can't tell that. But right now, that is the one. In particular, this kind of a cost has been worked out with the service provider with an agreement between the CG centers and the service provider saying that a million samples would be sent right annually across all the crops at an pre-agreed price, which is very, very discounted. And uh, national program partners in Asia and Africa can get benefit out of it. That's what and, I have to say. And as I said, that the cost of genotypy has to come down and down. I think there is research going on both from the public and private may, sector to bring this company, cost yeah. way down uh, so that it can be integrated in the breeding programs. Yeah. yeah. I think the next to to topics we should be discussing Another... are uh, mid density assays for uh, genomic selection. Yeah, please. Genomic. Next question. Yeah, yeah. Like, excuse Kumar, me, sir. Or... Like, uh, we are having a lot of questions actually in the Just YouTube one, chat one box. Question I, I, I should answer. Yeah, okay, okay. There is Mr. Arjun Kumar who writes fungal resistant varieties, probably no need for uh, pesticides. So, Janila, on behalf of you, I am answering. <laughs> <laughs> so, if it is resistant to rust and in rust endemic area, there uh, may not be uh, much need of chemical spray. And if it is for leaf spot, uh, particularly late leaf spot uh, resistant, uh, so you may not spray, uh, I mean, in that lip resistant, uh, lip spot resistant variety. But if it is not multiple resistant, suppose it is only for rust resistance and now lip spots are there, you have to spray. But after all, it's a foliar fungal disease. So you can't say that foliar fungal disease resistant variety, no spray could be, uh, is required. Spray will be required depending upon uh, the resistance, whether it is simple, single resistance, multiple resistance, intensity of resistance, I mean, all these, you cannot have resistant variety. These are all mostly tolerant varieties. Even in BT cotton, now there are a lot of sprays are made. So, uh, I mean, you can understand. So don't be in a, uh, uh, I mean, uh, believe that resistant variety doesn't require any spray. Maybe you have reduced to one tenth, you have reduced to uh, one twentieth. I mean, that much one spray can do. I think uh, you, if you want to speak on that, you can still... Oh, go ahead, that's fine. Yeah, please go ahead. The next question. Uh, in the interest of time. Yeah, actually, we are having a lot of questions in the YouTube chat box continuously, ma'am. Oh. Uh, like uh, this will be so in this session is so interesting to the participants as well. So we'll be mailing all the questions. Mailing, mailing. Mailing the way, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'll mail you all the questions and afterwards. So we can go ahead with the uh, next events, I I suppose, with the permission of the panelists. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, I am still fully charged <laughs> to understand the young minds, what kind of questions they are making and what are uh, the ideas moving in their brain. But uh, interesting. Anyway, we should interact more to them, listen to them, and there might be merit also. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Dr. Sunil, sir, have raised the hand in between. Sir, do yeah, you yeah. have any questions? Uh, please, let, let, let us see. Thanks. Thanks, Chaitanya, uh, for the I didn't invite to join this meeting and it was really interesting. You know, always you listen to Dr. Janila and Mukti Sudan Bas, so it was a really learning experience. Uh, I congratulate Dr. Janila for this nice presentation. 
uh, and then it was even you know a very holistic one so when you see the you know historical perspectives there are few facts even even i was not aware you know despite being six year with the team uh, and then uh, it was really great uh, the presentation in 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 terms you know uh, how science has been you know impactfully delivered so we have science and their developed product but uh, in terms of you know success stories the the kind of success stories that has been shared and created by the grounded building team the crescent uh, it is really nice and i really congratulate so uh, actually just i have a basic question you know now you know we are moving especially asia and africa is moving towards high volume one so my question to both you know dr janila and dr basu you know how they see the future of high volume especially in asia and africa and do we expect you know a big change in terms of you know groundnut value chain or groundnut cultivation and then how it could you know uh, be very profitable uh, to the farmers uh, in these reasons so janila should i answer first go ahead dr basu now i have become an uh, businessman yes selling my scientific knowledge to my community business community those who are dealing business with groundnut right. and i am 101 plus and 101 percent convinced that if the varieties are having high oleic there are many advantages in terms of storage in terms of product and in terms of uh, the taste and all these kind of things and you will never believe india probably we are the first one but uh, australia us since decades they have been using high oleic variety so sanolic uh, uh, i came probably in touch as back as 1984 or so visiting north carolina working with them for some time uh, i mean nc and other varieties i mean from there again when went to australia there are almost almost all the varieties are now very high oleic variety they can't talk groundnut variety without high oleic and i think it's a boon and i as a businessman will definitely harvest the benefit out of it how do i do so suppose if it is table purpose groundnut variety khari singh as gujaratis are selling even you can reduce the rancidity in that particular stock while storing almost say 6 month 7 month of storage you are reducing rancidity and now when i am talking about product diversification peanut butter i am sure and now i mean blending organic in that so i am doubly happy my peanut is organic my peanut is having high oleic and i have the reason to beat my drum that okay come here here is the best product in india so what i have started doing and displaying in rajkot and uh, as a businessman i am happy with high oleic and it has all the added benefits required in promoting business whether it is export indigenous or uh, even your personal consumption on daily basis now you can supplement uh, thank you dr basu that was nice actually huh? from the business perspective you have given it so i would just uh, add upon that saying that if you look at the lifestyle disorders right globally and india has a huge burden of it as well i yeah. think uh, the right oil consumption of right edible oil starts from there in india we have this now mission mode of increasing the edible oil uh, indigenous production of edible oils but then we are focusing more on palm oil and all i think at some point of the time it's rather than realizing a like green revolution that we are consuming too much of rice and wheat now it's time to move to millets we shouldn't be doing the same for oils as well we need to move towards healthy oils and high oleic is the one which could be one healthy oil for several consumer health benefits and there is an opportunity now with having these varieties and that that's the direction we have to move in forward there is a lot of industry interest right both from mncs and domestic uh, processing industries as well and uh, the good thing about hyolic is it has a combination with agronomic as well so with the quality improvement we are not compromising the yeah. the agronomic production so that's important when we think about the farmers so i mean i don't see any reason why such variety should not be promoted uh, from from different uh, angles as well so that's my take on it Uh, and uh, from the millennials as well you know so i i'm assuming that there would be much more responsible consumers than we are like my generation and dr bus's generation is and they would be definitely thinking for both from the healthy perspective and also the sustainability perspective as well whether what i consume is 
produced through sustainable practices or not and that's when comes in the oil coming from a legume you know and a healthy oil like high oil coming from a legume would be an alternative so i'm looking at from that perspective and just touching upon the butter peanut butter compared to the milk butter it has 25% protein while yeah. your milk butter is 100% fat now yeah. i think it's time that we move on from uh, towards a uh, peanut butter as well particularly i think in uh, urban areas this change has to happen and i'm sure that this millennials eating habits and the choices would drive such changes no janila now there is another development i mean uh, in peanut oil now the refined oil era has yes. gone i yes. can say yes. and now people are moving towards cold pressed right. oil with natural aroma yes. and in rajkot we have established a plant from our oh. side by one entrepreneur and okay. my hyolic variety the seed which i got from you Will yes. be pressed. They are cold pressed, marketed Good. organic cold pressed uh, high oleic oil. Yes. So bottle design and all those things are there. And again, um, on twenty sixth, I am moving to Odisha to establish mm-hmm. that kind of things in in between Puri and Lake Chilka. So okay. IT groups, so one IT group is spending money for that. Okay. So I will be spending four days there to promote. Oh, and uh, to know and that. only one thing because you are in active research now, you, mm-hmm. your word will be listened by the. Uh, authority, maybe Asia Research Authority. Sure. Whatever variety comes, mm-hmm. I mean, released at the national level, at mm-hmm. least there should be a, uh, I mean, minimum level of olic in that. So <laughs> improvement of yeah. olic is a must. Not yeah. only the yield. Yeah. I mean, in terms of oil, in terms of olic, and in terms of yield. So that there should be a, I mean, combination. Not only yield. But uh, low oil and low oleic no doesn't say make any sense. Yes, yes. So that kind of pressure should be there. Maybe selection pressure, then pressuring <coughs> the government as a policy, and ultimately we see at the end of the day, maybe after five ten years, I mean our varieties also will be very high oleic as in Australia and US. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And uh, like Abigna, you can proceed further. So well. As we all could witness, this was extensively informative session. Thank you very much, Dr. Janila and Dr. Basu, for such a flawless progression of event and for illuminating the subject to this extent. Thank you very much. For the next event, I would like to do- call upon Dr. Sujeshri, Chief Operating Officer of Plant Genomia from IARI, New Delhi, for carrying forth the interview round. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhignya. Uh, first of all, uh, I thank you so much for delivering such an insightful presentation, ma'am. And uh, you were very much enthusiastic in presenting your research results and uh, that are definitely going to help the science community. So, sir, uh, in this session, uh, I have a few questions to both of you to know your visions and thought uh, in various aspects that our audience are really interested about. So, initially, uh, I will start with Janilia, ma'am, and then I'll come to Dr. Basu. So, ma'am, uh, my first question is, uh, the early stage of your scientific career are uh, fraught with many uh, hardships and um, troubles. So uh, being a successful eminent scientist, uh, can you share with us the secret of your winning formula uh, for your success? And also uh, your inspiration and the support from the family to pursue a career in this plant science. Okay, so yes, thank you for your kind words on the presentation first. Thank you. And uh, when I started uh, my first job at the university, right? So, uh, you know, it was an, uh, a bit laid back atmosphere with some of the researchers telling that uh, you, don't, you don't have to be so very over enthusiastic in your work, you know, you need to be cool, count the days and take the salary. But then I said, no, 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 I should not get carried away with a few of them who say so. But there are some, you know, the proportion is always less who are enthusiastic uh, to carry forward the work. So at the time, even with working with the university, I said that getting funds to do the work, what we want to do is very important. So then when there was an opportunity with the AP Netherlands government, I applied for a project proposal. And it started off with that, you know, when once you have project and you have students, research scholars helping you to do the work, you know, and uh, no looking back, you know. So, I mean, I think having that positive attitude and really want to contribute, right? See, I always see it like this, you know. So what is my passion? You know, my passion is to work, uh, thinking that my work can help 
to the farmers. It could be in India, it could be Asia and Africa when I come to Ikrisar. So that's what. So, and, and uh, when I'm in university, the government paying me to pursue my passion. That's fantastic. So let me contribute it for it, right? Even more. So where you get to be paid to pursue your passion, you know, except in such kind of agriculture research, there are limited uh, things, right? I don't think such a thing would happen in an IT job, right? In that uh, routine IT job. So, I mean, th that's the passion which kept driving me, you know? So, yes. So, yeah, man, and, it's, uh, uh... coming to the family support, Yes, it's, it's always been uh, uh, very nice. Nobody said uh, no. I mean, I mean, I brought up in a family wherein like uh, um, I mean, uh, the children's thoughts or my thoughts, individual thoughts are given very importance. So coming from that atmosphere has always helped me to take my decisions. Yeah. Yeah. Really uh, nice words. Like uh, your passion in research has made a successful scientist, ma'am. It's really nice to hear about that. And my uh, next question is, ma'am, uh, can you share like uh, any turning point or a kind of a defining moment in your work as a scientist? I mean, like uh, we would like to know the most important scientific finding that surprised or excited you all through your research. Uh, the scientific finding. I would say that it is uh, not a very positive one, but it did excite me, you know. So when we had this populations with the Sano Lake, you know, we had the Spanish stripes crossed with Sano Lake. And then uh, because we were very keen that we have to deliver this Hyolic at the earliest, we used to generate a huge population. And to my surprise, we have planted in two hectares and we had hardly few lines which are really worth to be forwarded to the next generation. I mean, that's a surprise. I mean, I was thinking that I would end up with hundreds of lines uh, which could be fixed and then I can put them for the ergonomic testing, but that's not the case. In uh, 2014 and 15, when we went to the field and I, I could get a few lines. I mean, that was a bit disappointing, but then still, I mean, we need to, I mean, that gave us the lead as well, I should say, though disappointing that in terms of the number of uh, useful segregants we could harvest was less. But then there were ones which we harvested were really good. And from there, we have this, uh, the first releases in India. Yeah, yeah ma'am. It's interesting to know, like, how enthusiastic you are in the research, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. My next question is, um, you have trained many masters and PhDs, ma'am. So uh, can you share with us the experience of uh, mentorship and research training experience? I mean, uh, in the context of characterizing the ideal mentoring uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, can you share some tips to begin or encourage the good mentor mentorship relationships or practices? Yeah. So, yeah, that's a very important thing. So as, as I was telling you, no? so uh, I always give a lot of uh, freedom to the uh, research scholars who are working with me and I always think that they are equal partners in terms of technical knowledge and learning can happen both ways it's not me uh, teaching them or they uh, it's, it's both ways right that kind of atmosphere I always try to create and always encourage them uh, to speak more than I speak right so I always I always thought that because they are the ones who are spending more time in reading the new developments and all so they bring in a lot of knowledge to me rather than me because see I'm focused to the delivery of a product because that's what the institute uh, of, uh, wherever I work would be asking me to do that so I'm really bogged up with that and these are the young minds which would bring me the new knowledge and new thought process so I mean it was useful to me as well. And in the process, I think they always felt that their thoughts are valued, you know, and they are being encouraged uh, to express and talk. Uh, I think that kind of a healthy relation of equal, I mean, not only for uh, mentor, mentee relation, for any relation and even in the office space, that's what I see. See, we are all, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Each one of us will do, irrespective of what cadre we are in, it could be a technician or a researcher, but each of us will fit in a right, Right, become a right piece of puzzle in that uh, big jigsaw puzzle and complete it. So everyone is important. I think that uh, that is important. Yeah, ma'am. Really supportive kind of attitude you are having, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, my next question is, uh, the scientific research projects usually involve uh, knowledge intensive teams that require mm -hmm. members to share the knowledge. Yes. So in that case, uh, uh, in that framework, uh, can you share your perspective on requirement of a collaborative system uh, to improve the knowledge sharing in scientific research projects? Uh, in the project development, so see, uh, I would say that in an atmosphere like a crescent, wherein the de project development starts, the moment we have a concept idea, 
the moment a person has that idea or a particular team we definitely bring on board all our other team members both within the institute and also outside the institute on board for the designing of that you know it should start the collaboration should start from the designing of what we want to deliver and work through the process right there would be some people coming in going out all the time but then working towards it i think that kind of an atmosphere um has to be a uh, lot to be created i mean in institutes like ecrisat it exists right and then but uh, uh, the national institutes i think we need to much more develop and then uh, the biggest advantage working with ecrisat is having a multidisciplinary team see i don't have to be an expert in genomics to having used the genomic tools a person who is working in genomics will always help me so it's it's like that so multidisciplinary team with their uh, deep knowledge in each of those specific areas come together as a team and deliver so i think that can happen more even in our international programs across different countries yeah yeah ma'am so it's a good advice for the research development yeah ma'am uh, my next question is uh, uncertainty is inherent to the nature of science and science communication ma'am so you might have definitely experienced it so we would like to know uh, your formula in tackling the uncertainties uh, what you have faced in your research like the way how you conceptualize and operationalize uh, in such situations yeah So, uh, so uncertainties I could see from two perspectives. One is from the research, right? You know, so yeah. we have a uh, program, a design, and a program at the end of it. But there are risks as we move through it. It could be a simple risk like a pandemic, which we were all stuck with, right? Uh, and definitely, as in the design, the process we need to have a room for these risks as well. I think that's my suggestion. for the technological things and in the space where i work in ecrisat wherein we always uh, need uh, the donor support to continue our research work i think having a continuum of funding support is one thing which as a uh, researcher i need to plan and work with the collaborators yeah okay ma'am yeah my last question for you is ma'am like uh, many structural barriers uh, to gender equality in research and innovation persist but it is required to set gender equality as a cross cutting priority and we have to introduce uh, strengthened uh, provisions for that so ma'am uh, can you share your strategies or visions on this regard oh that's yes i mean um so many strategies uh you know see uh, this the simplest thing so allowing your fellow worker to speak you know so that's the one thing that kind of um, what should i say training to the entire staff when you're talking about gender bias a more training to the male community in the research organization should happen you know so they should understand accept right and Uh, enable and make ways and allow paths right for the women to move forward i think so that understanding that i mean it, it started coming in if not 100% at least to some level and that has to be more actually that's what i meant to say so women are now in a position want to take uh, bigger roles a larger pie and all that but then there's always a friction you know so i think uh, the male community in the research organization should be much more trained on these aspirations of the women and that uh, so that they can allow these spaces that's one thing i can think about it and the other thing is uh, uh, in some organizations kind of uh, a mentorship should help right uh, for a young women when they begin their careers the mentorship both it could be both with men and women right uh, senior mentors that can help a lot to grow in their careers and then build their careers as researchers despite they may have some breaks in the careers as well and some of the initiatives by the government of india are really great for the women researchers uh, even when they have breaks and all so and an enabling environment in the institute you know so i think that's 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 most important thing i feel yeah yeah ma'am like it, it's really inspiring words from your side mm -hmm. yeah ma'am uh, the lastly i would like to ask you like uh, what what is your uh, impression or opinion regarding our platform plangenomia oh, wow you are an incredible group you know you i should say that <laughs> so i mean i mean i, I didn't uh, expect this but then i was seeing you and interacting you with you people and all i think the whole idea was such a fantastic one you know and that's what i mean having this communication 
Mm-hmm. Yes, we have so many publications and all, but then having this communication and opening this channel, you know, particularly in the area of different subject fields and of the science, is a really good one. And this is the young minds doing it is is even more like you know, is wonderful to me, you know. So I really congratulate you, and uh, I would be there to support you with your mission uh, for the plant genomia. Yeah. Thank you so much, you. ma'am. Yeah, and you're doing a fantastic work. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, motivating us. And ma'am, uh, thank you, sh- uh, thank you for sharing uh, your experience and vision with us. And uh, we appreciate all the efforts you have taken uh, for this purpose. Yeah. Now moving to sir, uh, sir. Uh, this in the same way, I would like to. We would like to know, uh, like, what what is the thing that inspired you to pursue a career in research and plant science? If you if you uh, honestly ask me, after doing post graduation. entering into the service was by default okay <laughs> so so whatever job we got uh, i got entered there and initially i started my career as a jute researcher jute is a bus fiber crop then after doing uh, it that was under icr indian council of agricultural research in west bengal and that's called golden fiber particularly in bangladesh and uh, india these are the two countries producing 90% of the jute world over and after that i uh, opted transfer to uh, groundnut again by default because the situation in bengal that time politically it's a turmoil state and just being a pass out and uh, doing research uh, i got uh, more keen to research and uh, wanted to pursue my career further in research so opted transfer telling icr headquarters delhi that you transfer me anywhere in the country Where research atmosphere prevails. That's the only sentence request I sent to Delhi, and they thought I am joking with them. Being a Bengali, I cannot leave Calcutta, and they transferred me to Gir Forest, that is the last uh, land of India <laughs> before Arabian Sea starts. So I landed in Gujarat, Junagadh, Saurashtra region, and I stayed there for twenty-seven plus two years, twenty-nine with the groundnut research. and then of course we uh, came to ecrisat as a visiting scientist and that my journey still uh, on ground nut and what in one sentence i can say if you have uh, the sincerity for a particular crop for a particular organization for a particular cause you will be the master nobody can shake you whatever odd comes in between so that's the lesson i have learned and still i am pursuing at the age of 75 and Great, uh, moving sir. around just for pursuing the food re- i mean food legumes not groundnut but groundnut based cropping system i am pursuing so that farmers income and uh, is uh, reasonable and sustainable so so long uh, they are in the field carrying yes. the torch yeah <laughs> yeah it's a interesting journey like you had sir yeah sir my next question is sir um early career researchers they face uh, many challenges uh, in terms of funding or publishing or any kind of career progressions so in the same way sir uh, can you share with us the challenges that you have faced and how you have overcome it initially i mean during those early 70s you no know, joined in the service that time it's a uh, entirely government funded means there is a post there is a uh, money and they need a uh, manpower to carry out the research in that particular segment so that was our entry into the system that is indian council of agricultural research. research job is very safe you need not bother for funding but now days are changing okay. even there are financial crunch and moreover if you need to move in a new direction then you write projects then you go to the international authorities your colleagues who say were doing beautiful work and you want to collaborate with them in that process uh, i as a national cohen i i became the national coordinator i thought that stereotype value evaluation of varieties and then identifying a variety release it probably may not the end of it and i started um, working with different universities on their new novel techniques research and uh, trying to uh, i mean test it in indian soil indian atmosphere ground and working together that's the reason we got uh, many projects right from sir un and even uk on bambara ground not a totally new type of crops i mean it's a uh, 
basically uh, i mean your bigna cowpea species but name is groundnut since the pods are grown underground so uh, at least i was successful in writing projects getting fund and then diversifying my areas of working basically plant breeder but i became the international uh, consultant for un as a phytotoxin uh, experts <laughs> working in africa so it is nothing the example i am telling intuition how you want to grow and tomorrow you don't get surprise if i go into your engineering <laughs> cold press oil engineering so so there are a lot of engineering aspects and it is the keenness can take you to any height and i also pray to you all young stars that a discipline is should not be the barrier from engineering you can have the molecular biologist you can have biochemist and what not yes sir. even astronomy yeah anyway yeah. it's a, it's a really interesting sir sir my last question is uh, sir uh, could you please share with the share with our audience the takeaways or the word of advice for the research scholars in agriculture sciences and also we would like to hear from you the opinion and impression regarding our platform plan genomia the first question i have indirectly answered that young stars know it's not the discipline boundary should um, uh, limit you i mean travel beyond your uh, discipline boundary try to see learn what are the new things are coming where you can intervene or you can mend it to make it suitable for you and to take part in that kind of programs projects that's the thing otherwise you know as a basically plant breeder i never had the carbon isotope discrimination the gram farquhar group in australian national university during that time it was a nobel you know, work and whole world appreciated to that kind of things and i had no knowledge but simply because of the interest interacting uh, with them uh, slowly got into how what uh, the physiological mechanism and though i am a basically cytogeneticist again by specialization i worked in physiological genetics for phd and in iri professor sina was my guy renu khanna chopra professor sina sk sina and that time in those 70s 80s no physiological genetics again a very high thought subject because of uh, i mean lot of analysis that is um, uh, relative growth rate nation uh, net assimilation rate they are uh, i mean uh, evaluation quantification i mean it's a huge and only we had some kind of hand calculator facet machine not even the uh, electronic digital calculator so that's the things that you never take your boundary that it is limited and self move as much as you can and now the platform i think uh, you can um, uh, opt me as a permanent member to <laughs> to listen you people and i am so excited and uh, i have already uh, spoke to my children my they are also by default agriculturist one in us and my daughter mm-hmm. is in germany both a molecular biologist but uh, i mean this kind of things know about your platform i have already briefed them that here is a platform of young guys and i am the oldest member in that of course i think peter uh, i know peter who was also in the director and he is vice chancellor of kerala agriculture university those people are there uh, and it's a really unique to become in touch with such a uh, subject such a uh, group and the lobbying what you are making you no know, putting taking people together and uh, uh, i mean focusing uh, particularly the science making it uh, reaching it to all that i appreciate and uh, really hats off to you and whenever you call me i will be uh, i mean reaching to your door steps no problem and i will be spending i spent two hours and uh, i mean forgetting all other aspects thank you uh, sir really yeah. is supporting uh, supporting hands very from your much, side very sir much we really appreciate your effort in uh, coming today sir and finally uh, i thank you so much for this interactive uh, interactive session and grateful for the effort made by both of you in sharing your thoughts and experience with us and also uh, sir and ma'am uh, we request your kind future support in our scientific platform for enabling us to concentrate more in achieving uh, various scientific goals and activities very effectively thank you so much i will be propagating your plant genomia Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank sure. you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this was truly an amazing interaction to have waited upon. Thank you, Dr. Sujeshi, for executing the interview. That most certainly was quite intriguing. Now, wasn't that a mind-blowing session we had? So thanks a lot, Dr. Janila, Dr. Basu, and also Dr. Sunil Chaudhary 
associate scientist legumes world vegetable center south asia for taking a valuable time to join us and not to forget our brilliant audience who have contributed for the success of this event so reaching to the end of this i would like to clarify the process of attaining the certification for the same a feedback and certification link has been shared in the chat box and the youtube comment box as well you are all kindly requested to go on to the scene fill it up register yourselves and thereafter within a slot of 2 week your certificate will be shared accordingly and if there is some error and you do not receive your certificates after a week's time kindly visit our official website www.plantgenomia.com please know that the link is valid only for to us thank you ma'am thank you sir thank you for giving me the opportunity thank you thank Bye. you once again okay thank you and all the best for you all thank, thank you, you ma'am ma So we can close it now. Thank you. Thanks, okay, Krishna Chaitanya, especially. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for Bye, discovering sir. me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chaitanya. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thanks for joining.